Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the symposium on categorical semantics of, of entropy. Um, this is the tutorial session, and, and I'm uh, de delighted to have two very gifted communicators uh, for the tutorial session. Uh, I, first up is John Baez, and uh, I, I first met John here in New York, I think it was 22 or 23 years ago on the occasion of Dennis Sullivan's birthday. Uh, John was talking about quantum gravity at the time. And since then, I've been uh, really impressed with the breadth and the depth of John's research and, and, uh, and his incredible energy. Um, the blog post from about a decade ago, Entropy as a Functor, uh, was a real turning point in the, in the, the theory uh, that we're going to hear about um, this week. Uh, and of course, I'm especially impressed with John's interest and ability to uh, speak to people in, in simple terms, if they want to hear it in simple terms, or with lots of detail, if they want to hear lots of detail. Um, uh, so uh, this symposia series is, is hosted here at the Initiative for Theoretical Sciences at, at the CUNY Graduate Center. Um, for those of you that aren't, aren't uh, familiar with ITS at CUNY, um, it, its aim is to de develop elegant um, mathematical descriptions of, of the world and, and theoretical science. Um, as a theoretical center, it's um, an important complement to like data-driven science and experimental science. Uh, the founding director, Bill Bielek, uh, has done a great deal of work studying entropy in biological systems and in physics. Um, and in fact, in a recent post on azimuth, John Baez uh, linked articles related to this symposium topic um, uh, on entropy and biological systems, mentioning um, Bill Bielek's work in, in particular. So uh, without um, much more delay, I'm happy to turn things over to John, who's going to tell us about entropy as a, as a functor. And, um, and let, me, let me say that John's happy to be um, interrupted uh, with questions. Uh, he, he's, he's, we're hoping for um, lots and lots of questions so that we can use, you know, the, uh, as, you know, an hour, let's say an hour of an hour of prepared discussion, but we, we have a, a half an hour um, built in um, so that we can stop and, 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 and ask questions. Um, it may not be um, easy to, to ask the question in the, in the chat or, um, so if you just want to raise your hand and, and, um, uh, and, and ask on Zoom, that, that'll work really well too. So um, I'm going to uh, turn, turn things over to John. John, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, it's really exciting to see this whole program devoted to the categorical semantics of entropy. Um, it's a subject that I think is just getting started in a way. Um, but it's been going on for a while already. Um, what I mean by just getting started is that I don't think we've yet really figured out how to harness these ideas and do things with them as well as we someday will. I think we will. So I'd like to talk about what I'll call Shannon entropy from category theory. So most of my talk, I'll just be talking about Shannon entropy, which is the entropy of a probability distribution on a finite set. Uh, there are many other forms of entropy and people in this uh, whole tutorial and then later the workshop will be talking about of entropy. Uh, but category theory is so general and abstract that it can handle a lot of them and you'll actually see talks about that. Uh, but to illustrate the ideas, I think it's good to focus on a very simple sort of entropy, which would be Shannon entropy for me. So that's will be my focus. But then at the end, I'll, I'll mention some other more recent work on uh, generalizing these ideas to other forms of entropy. And there will also be talks about that. Um, right, let's see if I can get my screen going. Okay, so what is Shannon entropy? Well, you have a probability distribution on a finite set X. So that means for each element, little X of the set X, there will be a probability P that's greater than or equal to zero and they add up to one. 
that's a probability distribution. And then from that, Shannon came up with this measure uh, number called the entropy, uh, which is just minus the sum of P of X log P of X. So if you look at what P log P is for a number between zero and one, you'll see that it's, it's ne negative. It's less than or equal to zero. Uh, so this minus sign here gives us a positive quantity, uh, which is the Shannon entropy. And you should think of this, I'm sure you all have your own ways of thinking about it, but if you haven't ever thought about it, uh, you, you can think of this as a measure of how spread out P is. So it will be maximized when all the probabilities P sub X are equal to each other. And that's like a completely flat probability distribution. You could think of that as the probability distribution of maximum ignorance where you don't know anything. So if you have like N alternatives, you just say, yeah, I guess the probability of each one of and because I don't have any, <laughs> I don't have any better idea. On the contrary, it will be minimized when one of the p of x's is, is is one and all the rest are zero. That's like when you're sure of what's going on, uh, and so those situations will have entropy zero, and those will be like the least evenly spread probability distributions. So a lot of work due to Shannon and others have given a somewhat more. Uh, a deep understanding of what, what the meaning of this quantity is, Shannon realized that it was connected to information. And you could say it's how much information you learn on average when someone picks an element of the set X according to the probability distribution P and then tells you what it is. It's how much information you'd learn when you find out that randomly chosen element well, how much you learn always depends on how much you knew ahead of time. And so here I'm assuming that ahead of time, all you had known was that this uh, element was randomly distributed according to the probability distribution P. So for example, if you flip a coin, uh, and if, so there are, your set X has two elements in it, heads and tails. And in the situation of a fair coin, where you know ahead of time that the coin is fair, so the probability of heads and probability of tails are both one half, then you can work out what the Shannon entropy is in that situation, and you get logarithm of two. Computer logarithms in base E here, it doesn't really matter too much what base you use, you just have to make up your mind. Uh, so if you're using base E, the, and you wanna talk about units of information, You'd, you'd call the units nats for natural logarithm. So you'd learn log two nats of information. Uh, but very often people use base two for their logarithms. And if we used base two instead of base E, then of course the log logarithm of two would be just one. And that sort of information, that measurement of information we call bits. So you'd learn one bit of information. And so that's supposed to be intuitive that if you, if you, if I flip a coin, and I cover it up with my hand. And then I lift up my hand and you see whether it landed heads or tails, you've learned one bit of information, either heads or tails. Um, but you see, it depends on the probability distribution we started with. If, if it was a coin that always landed heads up for some reason, so that P of H was one and P of T was zero, you repeat the calculation of the entropy. By the way, we're defining zero log zero to be zero in this game because that's the, um, if you try to take the function x log x and make it be uh, continuous, it extends continuously down to zero, even though log of zero is undefined. Uh, and so, so, so if, you, if you look at x log x and you let x approach zero from above, it approaches zero. So we define zero log zero to be zero in this game. So, so we get zero which I already told you, I already told you that if you have a completely spiked probability distribution that takes the value one at one point and zero everywhere else, then the entropy is minimized and it's zero. So what I'm saying is that like, if I say, hey, this coin is gonna land heads up, I flip it, I cover it up, <laughs> I lift it up, and now you see, yep, it landed heads up. Well, what did you learn? You learned nothing because you knew ahead of time that it would land heads up. So one way to think about Shannon entropy 
is that it's the expected surprise. I love this phrase, the expected surprise, because it sounds oxymoronic. How could it be a surprise if you expect it? Well, what I really mean here is that there's a way to think about uh, how surprised you should be by an event. And there, this term is technically called surprisal. So you can convert probabilities into, uh, into other kind of numbers called surprisals by taking their negative logarithm. So that that means that um, you're turning the multiplicative aspects of probability theory, like how probabilities for independent events multiply. And by taking the logarithm, you're, you're turning that into so that you'd be like twice as surprised uh, if two events of probability one tenth occur than if one event of probability one tenth occurred. And, and we make we take the negative logarithm because we want to get a positive number for our surprisal. So you can think of negative logarithm as an operation that turns probabilities into surprisals or amounts of surprise. And then what we're doing when we're computing entropy is we're computing the expected value of the surprisal. So we're, we're averaging all these surprisals minus log px, but we're averaging them weighted by the probability that those various events will occur. Now I'm calling elements of the set x events, which is common in probability theory. So Shannon entropy is how surprised you should be on average or how surprised you will be on average if one of these events occurs with event little x occurring with probability p sub x. So you could say that Shannon entropy is the expected surprisal. Now, that all sounds convincing and, and you could go ahead from there and do lots of stuff with Shannon entropy and people have, and you know, one could easily give like a weeks long talk <laughs> about all the things that people have done with Shannon entropy, but that's not the direction I'm going to go in. I'm going to go in this strange new direction, which is to, which involves questioning Shannon entropy. So like, I could try to persuade you that that was the right thing to think about, but it's worth noting for starters that there are lots of alternative notions of entropy that people have studied. So one famous one is called Salas entropy. It has this rather scary looking formula and I urge you not to dwell on the formula. Um, it has, it's actually a whole bunch of notions of entropy, one for every real number that's not equal to one. When, when alpha equals one, you'd be defining by zero here. And also this would also equal zero. Uh, or there's another one parameter family of entropies that's very well uh, studied called the Renyi entropy. Again, don't worry about the details of the formula. This is not really a talk about <laughs> Renyi entropy or Tsalas entropy. If I talked about those, I would have to like try to convince you that these were reasonable formula. They look sort of like random formula that have been pulled out of a hat when you first see them. They look horrible, actually. So don't worry, but don't let that slow you down, okay? Uh, and again, Renyi entropy makes sense for a, val a range of values of alpha, alpha being non-negative here uh, and not equal to one. One interesting feature is that if you take the limit as alpha approaches one of either of these quantities, you can evaluate that limit using uh, L'Hopital's rule and you get Shannon entropy. Um, so you can think of either of these quantities as like a one parameter deformation or warping of the traditional notion of Shannon entropy. And it turns out that both of them have some good properties. And Tom Leinster, uh, in this great free book called Entropy and Diversity, the Axiomatic Approach, I mean, you can buy a physical copy or you can get it off the archive for free. Um, does a really thorough study of properties of entropy and not just Shannon entropy, uh, but also these, these other versions. So you can, if you're interested in those, that's where you could look. Uh, Isaac, yeah. Um, is there, in like our metaphor for entropy is being surprised, is there like a metaphor for what alpha is supposed to represent? Uh, wow. So I just told you, don't think about these. And, and so I guess that's like a formula to make people want to think about them. Um, <laughs> ah, wow, I really hadn't prepared and answered that. I'll just tell you, read Tom Leinster's book and he will, he, he's actually thinking about um, biodiversity 
uh, and measuring biodiversity using these different entropy measures. And so he will give you like some kind of intuition for what different um, values of alpha do when in, in that context. And I guess the idea here is that like when alpha gets to be larger and larger, you're taking these quantities, which are typically less than one, and raising them to the alpha power. So this will get smaller and smaller. So when you make alpha be really big, you're saying, don't worry so much about low probability events. Just like, don't, don't count them so much. Whereas when you're making alpha small, you, you count them more. So he's thinking about biodiversity. So he's, so, <coughs> so that would be like related to the prevalence of different kinds of species. And people are busy trying to understand biodiversity and quantify it so that they can try to save biodiversity. And so there's a question of like, um, how, how much does it help biodiversity to have lots of the same species? Uh, and so you could have different opinions about how, how, how much you care about having lots of different kinds of species versus having lots of one particular kind. And, and those different opinions could be sort of, uh, you can pick an opinion by picking a value of alpha. So that, that's, I guess, all I can say about that right now. Um, yeah. So, so, but my main reason for introducing these concepts here now is just to let you know that it, like, it's not like people never thought of anything except Shannon entropy. There are other alternative notions of entropy. And that raises the question more strongly, you know, what's so great about Shannon entropy as compared with these other notions? Or is there something great about it? Uh, maybe there's something great about these other notions too, but, <laughs> but what's so good about, about Shannon entropy? Um, so it would be nice to have some theorems that say that if you have X, Y, and Z appealing properties, then your entropy function should be Shannon entropy. There are actually lots of theorems of this general sort um, because there are lots of different properties that Shannon entropy has and different combinations of properties could uh, be used to single out Shannon entropy. And Tom's book has a number of such theorems and there are other such theorems. There's a book by Kinchin about such theorems. But one of the most important properties is co called the chain rule. Someone was just arguing with me on Twitter saying it shouldn't be called the chain rule. So I, I don't I don't want to argue for the name chain rule, but I just want to tell you what the rule is. So, so before I can even tell you what the rule is, I got to introduce the concept that we can compose probability distributions. So for example, here I have a, this is like a little picture of a probability distribution on a three element set. So you can imagine like you can walk down three different uh, aisles. Three, you've got like three different doorways, like in a lady in the tiger scenario, one of them has a tiger in it or something, but you get it. But in this situation, you have three alternatives, each with probability one third. Here you have one alternative with probability one. Here you have two alternatives with probability three quarter and one quarter. And what we're doing is we're taking those three probability distributions together with a single probability distribution on a three element set, one half, zero, one. So there's a way that's pretty obvious to combine all these probability distributions to get a probability distribution on the set of uh, leaves of this tree. So this tree here has six leaves. And so we're getting a probability distribution on the six element set. And it's just works like this. So like you say, you have like a one half probability of walking down this uh, hallway. And then you have like a one third, sorry, a one half probability of walking down this hallway. And then a one third probability of walking the, or down here. So one half times a third is a sixth. So the probability that you wind up here should be one sixth, which we see here. So you just multiply the, these three numbers by, by the relevant one of these numbers to get numbers here. And of course, the, you still get a probability distribution. So this is a very important way to uh, compose probability distributions in a tree-like pattern. Uh, so it happens whenever you're in life, you have like several alternatives occurring with different probabilities. And then if one of those occurs, then you have several more alternatives which occur with various probabilities. And so if you lump those two uh, uh, sets of choices into a single 
choice like this, you get a probability distribution on the set of choices. So that's a nice operation on probabilities. Now, if you've thought a lot about these tree-like things and thinking of operations as being drawn like trees, then maybe you will have bumped into the concept of operad. So there's a concept called operad, which is all about this, which I will not talk about. Um, well, I might have to, because I'll answer Emmy's question no matter what it is. But, but I, first, I want to say that, uh, that my goal is not to explain operads at all, but I'm hinting at them here. And Ty Danae Bradley, will, in the second talk of today, will be talking all about operads. Hey, Emily disappeared. Did you give up on me? Emmy oh, Blumenthal? Oh, am I here? Yeah, you're yeah. here. So What's your would question? this be an, yeah, would this be an example of forming a mixture distribution? Like what, what we're doing here? Uh, I'm wondering because if I, I know mean, the technical definition of a mixture like distribution. In, okay, I don't in know like if I know quantum that. mechanics, at least they talk about like, Oh. You take two like wave functions or something and you add them point wise to get a new distribution versus doing something like taking like a product, you know, like a uh -huh. independent product of two probability distributions. So it'd be like uh -huh. um, choosing so between two Gaussian random variables. Would this be an example of that or would this be an example of like independent product uh, uh, pairing? This can handle a number of Thing. So first of all, I just have to emphasize, although you're probably perfectly aware of it, I'm not saying anything about quantum probability now. Yeah, um, yeah. And that raises I, I'm like a whole, whole extra bunch of uh, different kind of ways of thinking mm -hmm. about, you know, uh, <laughs> pure states, mixed states, all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. So so one thing you could do is like if I could I could take a probability distribution here. And I could take some other probability distribution on some other set and just stick that, that other one on every branch here. So like if I stuck this little picture of one third, one third, one third, if I put it on all three of these, then I would just be taking the product of two probability distributions. So I am able to achieve that as a special case of this. But, but this is more but this is more general here. So I guess that's all I will say is that you, we can okay. get products of probability distributions, but this is a, a very nice okay. generalization of that. Okay. Um, I will Thank say you. that like, yeah, sure. I will say that um, one of the things that people are starting to do is to try to generalize these ideas to quantum probability. And there will be a talk, uh, which I'll mention later coming up on Friday about the quantum version of some of these ideas. But I'm not doing anything so fancy as that. Um, right. So now, whenever you compose probability distributions in this kind of tree-like pattern, Shannon entropy obeys a certain rule, which is called the chain rule. Don't ask me why it's called the chain rule. Um, let's focus on understanding the rule. <laughs> so the the entropy of the new probability distribution that we formed by composing this bunch of probability distributions, now I'm writing it over here on the left, this entropy here is equal to a sum, and it's this sum. It's the entropy of the probability distribution on the bottom, which plays a special role compared to these ones on top. So H of one's half, zero, one half, plus the weighted average of the entropies of the probability distributions on the top. So we see these three probability distributions on the top of our little tree, and they, there they are, and they're getting multiplied by these weights, by these numbers, one half, zero, and one half, which are just the probabilities down here on the bottom. So the idea is that the entropy or the expected surprise of this uh, combined probability distribution is the entropy of the, the first choice that you have to make plus, and then that first choice leads you on to these multiple possible choices, uh, that entropy plus the weighted average of the entropies of those various choices where they're all weighted by the probability that that occurs. Um, so you can check this out you can, you can prove this just by doing a little, some calculations uh, using the formula for Shannon entropy. 
attempt to prove this chain rule, but it's a, I guess it's one of those kind of things. It's a lot better to do by yourself than to watch someone else do it because it's not all that exciting to, to do when someone else is doing it, but it's, it's more fun when you're doing it yourself because you've got something at stake, namely, will I succeed? <laughs> so, so you, but you will succeed, you can do it. Um, does everyone understand? Well, I, I'll, I'll ask if everyone understands this rule, but I'll, I'll ask it in a minute. Let me just state it more in the general case. I was doing an example. I've been told, <laughs> I've learned that you should do examples before stating general rules. So here's, well, this is a little bit more general. Here, I'm still just considering the case of a tree that has this particular shape of a three branches here and then three, one, two here. That's irrelevant. That's just an, still just an example, but I'm saying the P here is my general name for a probability distribution on this three element set. And then Q1 is a probability distribution on this first set, which happens to have three elements. Q2 is a second probability distribution. Q3 is the third. And so this formula that I gave you an example of, it, looking, saying it a bit more generally, it's, so it's the entropy of the composite probability distribution that's built up out of this is the entropy of the one on the bottom, it's the weighted average of the entries of the three different probability distributions. Well, I said three on top, but there's nothing special about it being three on top. It could be any finite number. I'll write the general general formula in a second, but this is this is uh, this is like a little bit more general than the example I started out with. We don't have specific numbers now. So what's the general general rule? So here here's the general rule. So here we need some notation for this process of composing a single probability distribution on an n element set with n different probability distributions. So that this circle here is this operation of composing probability distri distributions. So P is a probability distribution on this on the set one through n, and then Q1 and Qn are n different probability distributions on finite sets that could have any cardinality. And so the entropy of the whole thing is the entropy of P plus this weighted average of the entropies of each of the probability distributions QI. So that's like the way you, you write this as a, this rule as a formula. Yeah, Seth? Oh, hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, in each of these examples, like each of the final uh, events or final leaves of that tree, there's only sort mm -hmm. of one path to them. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's required. required that's result, or yeah, that's yes, that's yes, it is. That's what a tree is, right? So uh, when it, when you're in a tree, you uh, you so, have so, only so, one route to any leaf. But for example, like if in stage one you picked a biased coin or a fair coin, and then stage two you flipped it, but we still named the events, you know, just two things, heads and tails, would we still have the same result in that case? Or I think uh, the thing, no, but I'm not certain. I think the answer is, I don't promise anything in that type <laughs> of situation. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, yeah. So let I think basically the answer is going to be no. So I'm, I'm very much limiting myself to a graph here, which is just a tree. Where so there's only one possible route to each one of these things on top here, which we call leaves in the in the language in the theory of trees. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. So it'd be different if you could like get to if like these two like stuck together or something like that. That would be that would change the game. Um. Yeah. Thanks. Um. So this, in a way, this this rule here is like the core of everything that I'm going to say. I will state some slick abstract category theory results. Uh, and with slick, beautiful hypotheses. But if you unravel the hypotheses of these results, one of the hypotheses will imply the chain rule. So the chain rule is sort of what makes it all tick. So here's a theorem. This is a theorem originally proved by Fadeyev, and it's often called Fadeyev's theorem. But I'm stating it in a slightly different way than Fadeyev originally did. And Tom Leinster uh, restated it in this other way. So I should give Leinster some credit. And also another good thing to know is that if you want to see a proof of this theorem, you can look at the book by Tom Leinster that I 
referred you to. Um, so here's the deal. So suppose we have some candidate concept of entropy. In other words, suppose we have some map which sends any probability distribution on any finite set to a non-negative real number. So here are three properties that guarantee that this map will be some constant non-negative multiple of Shannon entropy. So first of all, it's invariant under bijections, right? So if you have a probability distribution on a finite set and you have a bijection, a one-to-one -one and onto mapping between that finite set and some other finite set, then you get a probability distribution on that other set just by carrying the probabilities along. So it would be really nasty if, if your supposed entropy measure was not invariant under bijections, because the bijections just means that you're relabeling the names of the elements of your set. So it shouldn't, the way we compute entropy shouldn't be depending on the names of the elements of the set. Second of all, I'm going to demand that I be continuous, right? So a probability distribution is some basically boils down to some n-tuple of real numbers. So there's a famous topology on n-tuples of real numbers, the usual topology on Rn, uh, or maybe on st stick to numbers between zero and one. Uh, it's got a famous topology. And so I is a map from not just some set of probability dis distributions, but a topological space of probability distributions to the real numbers. And we want that map to be continuous. Um, and that's a reasonable thing. We don't want entropy to jump dramatically if you change a probability just a tiny bit in a discontinuous way. And third, the most exciting one is that I obeys the chain rule. So if all three of these are true, then I has to be some non-negative multiple of Shannon entropy. We could pin down which multiple it is by um, giving what I equal on some particular example, like the, the, the coin with 50-50 probabilities, right? So when we define Shannon entropy, I said we used base E for the logarithm. If I used base seven instead, I would be changing entropy by some constant multiple. Uh, so as I said, it, that doesn't really matter so much. So here I'm just pinning down Shannon entropy up to a constant multiple. But this is quite an amazing theorem because it's saying that somehow the formula for Shannon entropy involving P log P pops out from these three conditions, which is not at all obvious. Yeah, so Dmitry Fadeyev proved this theorem originally in 1956. And you can, this is like an sort of different statement of it uh, in Leinster's book. I should add maybe that um, Fadeyev's original theorem did not assume the full chain rule. Fadeyev stripped down the chain rule to like a minimal case, one special case where you only, where your tree has a very special shape uh, that's a very simple shape. Um, and you can then prove that the chain rule holds for every possible tree if you assume it for trees of this particular shape. Uh, so, so Fadeyev was heading in the direction of sort of minimal assumptions, whereas Leinster was heading in the direction of uh, beautiful looking uh, general assumptions. And so Leinster just goes ahead and considers the general chain rule. Um, right. So. So the question arises, you know, how in the heck does the logarithm function or the x log x show up starting from these assumptions? I'm not going to prove this theorem. The proof is, I would say, like very characteristic of the flavor of proofs in analysis rather than category theory. So in category theory, you ideally hope that when you just like stare at the statement of the theorem long enough and keep like analyzing it and analyzing what it really means, you, you, you see it turns into a puddle of trivialities and which were the definitions of the concepts that you, that you stated. 
Of course, there are real theorems in category theory where you have to have, where you really have to work and sweat. But part of the appeal of category theory is that there are a lot of amazing, wonderful theorems like the Yoneda embedding theorem or the Yoneda lemma at least, where, where you can prove the theorem just by, by just sort of peeling the onion of the definitions basically and seeing what happens. Whereas in analysis, you very often, I've, I've heard it compared to like chasing a fox where the fox is like trying to sneak out of, the, of any trap that you may uh, try to erect around it and, and you just have to like plug all the holes. Uh, so this proof is more like that, which is maybe one of the reasons why I won't give the proof, but, but I'll give you an idea of the proof, I hope. So, so one thing is to look at a very particular case, namely, let's look at the, so I here remember is our candidate entropy function that we're trying to show is like Shannon entropy given our three assumptions. And so we're gonna give it the probability distribution on the N element set that's just completely evenly distributed. It's just one over N, one over N, one over N, one over N. Then using the chain rule, it's pretty easy to see. So let's call that something short. Let's call that phi of N. Then it's pretty easy to see that phi of M times N is phi of M plus phi of N. The way you see this is that you cook up a tree where the bottom uh, branch uh, has the, the bottom node has n branches, and then each of the top ones also has n branches. Sorry, sorry, has m branches. So there's a total of m times n branches. Uh, and then you use the chain rule and you crank away and you see that the chain rule says this. You, you know, it's probably better to do yourself. So, so we get this equation. Well, this equation has some obvious solutions, right? This, is a, this equation is just really saying that phi is a homomorphism from multiplication to addition. And we all know that that's why people invented the logarithm. So that this will have a bunch of solutions of the form phi of n is, well, it could be log in any base. So phi of n is some constant times the natural logarithm of n. The interesting thing is that this equation here has a bunch of other solutions. Um, at least if you believe in the axiom of choice, it has a bunch of other solutions. I think maybe in this integer case, it may have other solutions even without the axiom of choice. So to rule out the non-obvious solutions, you ultimately need to use the continuity condition on I. It's not quite obvious from what I'm saying how that does the trick, but, but I wanna point out that the only role of the continuity condition is to rule out weirdo solutions to this equation. Uh, so once you get that, then you then you know the uh, entropy of your, you know your candidate uh, entropy i of an evenly spread out distribution is just a constant times a log of n, and then from there you need to go on and consider other cases, and eventually work your way up to the general case that for any probability distribution i is given by this multiple of Shannon entropy. So so that's a step-by-step -step process of considering more and more cases and requires a lot of cleverness and cunning to, to work your way up to the general case. I'm not gonna do that. Uh, so all I really wanted to show you is like, give you some indication of like how the chain rule gets you into thinking about logarithms and where the continuity comes in, which is to rule out weird functions that behave somewhat like the logarithm function. That's all I really wanna say about this. Okay, so that's uh, Simon, yeah. Oh, thank you, can you hear me? Yep. Um, Shannon proved uh, this, um, didn't he? And what was Fadaid's uh, extra thing? Did he drop a, one of Shannon's hypotheses? I forget what Shannon proved. Did Shannon invoke the chain rule? I think. Wow, okay, also... then I really don't then I really don't have any idea what the difference is between Fedeyev's theorem and Shannon. Fedeyev's theorem is not quite this one. Fedeyev considered a version of the chain rule where you just split one of the brand. So he considered trees were like only one of these, all of these went straight up in a line like this one here, except for the first one, which just splits into two. So that's what he did. I don't, 
I'm sorry, I really don't know what Shannon did. Thanks very much. Yeah, so now I have to go back and and, uh, and find that out. That's interesting. Me too. <laughs> um, I have a feeling he did something or else the world's being incredibly unjust because everyone calls this Fideo's theorem, but, but who knows, I'll see. Um, okay, so, so that's a characterization of Shannon entropy, but it would be nice to see Shannon entropy emerge in other ways. I can imagine all sorts of things you might try to do, but I'm gonna talk about how to get Shannon entropy to come out of category theory. And that was our goal in this paper. So Tobias Fritz, Tom Lenston and I had a big conversation on the N Category Cafe, a blog that Tom and I are involved in. Uh, and uh, we came up with a number of results and the sort of simplest one was put into this paper here, a characterization of entropy in terms of information loss. You'll notice we, the title carefully avoids the word category theory because we were trying to reach people who, for whom that word might be like an instant turnoff. So uh, we could have called it like Shannon entropy out of category theory or something like that, but we wisely decided not to category theorists found out about this anyway, apparently. Um, so, so what's the idea here? Well, the one idea is just a, like this thing you always hear about category theory, that category theory is really about the morphisms, not the objects. The objects are just these sort of boring placeholders that, whose role is that when you get two of them, you get a set of morphisms between them. Uh, so, so that suggests that we should not talk about the Shannon entropy of objects, well, what's an object? Well, you get to make up your mind about what an object is, uh, but let's say an object is a finite set with a probability measure. That's what we've been talking about. But we're not going to talk about the Shannon entropy of an object. We're going to talk about the change in entropy due to some kind of morphism between these objects. So we're going to make up a category where the objects are finite sets with probability measures, but we're going to focus on change in entropy due to morphisms. So here's how it goes. There is a couple of interesting notions of a morphism between finite sets with probability distributions. I'm gonna take one that might not have been the one you would have guessed actually. So I'm going to take a morphism to just be a function from the first set to the second, which preserves probabilities in the following sense, that the probability distribution Q uh, on Y has the property that at any point Y, little y, that probability is the sum of the probabilities of the points little x that map to Y. So for example, if X has three elements with these three different probabilities and Y also has three elements, I probably should have picked Y to have four elements. It could have any number of elements, but anyway, I picked three again, just to make the picture look pretty, I guess. Uh, and, you, and the function is this reddish purple bunch of arrows here. Then you see that because one half plus a fourth is three fourths, that will be the probability of, of this point here in Y. And this one is zero because nothing's mapping to it. And this is one fourth because this one guy with probability one fourth is mapping to it. Um, so you could think of this as a, the function notice, there's nothing random about the function. You might've thought I would put some kind of randomness into this thing. And, there's things called stochastic maps, where like for each point in X, there's a probability of winding up at any point in Y. No, we're not doing that. We're just having F be a completely ordinary function. So you could think of it as a deterministic way of processing random data. So you have like uh, different, different, I don't know, I wanna emphasize the word data here, but you have like different alternatives with different probabilities. And then you say like, okay, I'm gonna apply some function that, uh, to convert those alternatives into some other alternatives. And the probability of winding up here is just the sum of the probabilities that we had something that mapped to that point. So it's pretty easy to see that this is a category that if you compose functions that have this property of being measure preserving, that the composite function is also measure preserving. So we get a category. I mean, the composition is associated and all that jazz. So it's a nice category. 
Um, so, so we get a category and I'll just call it fin prob. So that it has as objects, finite sets with probability distributions and as morphisms, these measure preserving maps between those. So does everybody, does everybody get what this category is? Um, this is our, this is the star of the show here now. So I, I want it all to, want to make sure it's sunk in. So I mean, this is the, this is the mental picture I have, although probably I shouldn't, you should have a mental picture where I could have any number of elements. Okay, everyone seems on board with the, the idea of this category. I mean, there are lots of other categories you could think about, and you should think about lots of other categories connected to probability theory, but we're just going to use this particular one. And there's a really interesting thing you can do, very simple thing you can do, which is if you have one of these morphisms in your category, then we can talk about the entropy of the initial probability distribution uh, and then the entropy of the new probability distribution, and you can subtract them. Uh, notice I'm subtracting the new from the old. So this I will call the entropy loss. It's, and part of why I'm doing it in this order, rather than like subtracting the old from the new, is that there's a nice um, result that says that this loss is always greater than or equal to zero. So there's a thing you can find like in, I guess a cover in Thomas's book on information theory and the classic uh, compendium of facts about entropy and information uh, that says it's called the data processing inequality. And it says that this is always greater than or equal to zero. So what we're, so that at first it might like freak you out because you've been told a million times that entropy always increases, right? Entropy always increases. That's this drives life on earth and all that jazz. Well, great, <laughs> but, but deterministic processing of random data in the sense that I've made precise here, it actually always decreases entropy. And you can see it happening in this little example that I gave you here because two different events are getting mapped to one, uh, the final probability distribution here is more sharply peaked than the original one. Because right, some probabilities can add up and create a larger probability, or you could have some points in here that aren't getting hit at all, and they'll have probability zero. So this probability distribution is more sharply sp spiked than the original one, and so its entropy turns out to be lower. I mean, it has to be lower. Uh, and so, so entropy has decreased in this process here. Um, so that's what we'll focus on, this, this entropy loss due to deterministic processes applied to uh, probability distributions. Uh, Avtech, which may be one of John Turla's pseudonyms, has a, is raising their hand. Yes, or were you trying to do that, Avtech? <laughs> Maybe not. Okay, no questions forthcoming, uh, apparently. Um, John, can you hear? Yeah, sure. No, okay, okay. Tom, um, Tom here is in the room. He, he has a question for you. I have a simple question. Can I interpret this loss in terms of uh, relative entropy instead? Relative entropy between two things? Uh, can you tell me how you intend to do so? I, I don't know, but it looks a lot <laughs> like a relative entropy. Uh, that, that's, oh, that's why I'm let's saying see. it. If I was really, okay, if I was really smart, I would like be able to quickly think I of think some something way. I think something you can do is uh, like condition, um, like uh, assuming a little bit more data, like you can get, you get a stochastic map from Y to X. From Y to X. You can certainly, Ah, you can probably get a stochastic map back from y to y to x by saying like you go back. Uh, well, this poor guy is in serious trouble, right? So how's that? How are you going to get a stochastic map for this guy? For these guys, you can like split up. You can say, hey, I got like a two thirds chance of going this way and a one third chance of going this way. For for this poor guy, I don't even know how I'd get a stochastic map. To oh, map that's a good guy. point. Sorry, I was just being stupid. Uh... No, so, you weren't being stupid. You're just a. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. 
Uh, yeah, so maybe it's the relative entropy of the push forward of P to Y relative to Y or something like that. Uh, I don't know. We'll have to think about this more sometime. Okay. But we, I mean, notice what I'm saying. I'm, the push forward of P, in case anyone doesn't know what that term means, that's exactly Q. Uh, so it's not like you got the push forward of P, so Q. In this game, this, 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 ah, I seem unable to go backwards. Okay, yeah, so the, this formula here if, with a little more jargon, I would have said Q is the push forward of P. That's what push forward means. Um, so, so to do relative entropy, I'd need to have like two different probability distributions on the same on the same set. And I can't see how to get them on X and I can't see them to get them on Y. Maybe if I was smart, I could do them on like X times Y or something like that. Uh, Abdul? Yes, I just have a question about my intuition of these measure preserving maps. Is, is uh -huh. marginalization um, over a subset of X a very good example of measure preserving yeah. or a counter example? That sounds like a very good example. So let's see, if I know what marginalization is, your, your set X would be like a product of two sets, A times B. And then you project that down onto one of the two sets, like A. Right. And so if I had any probability distribution on A times B, I could push it forward and get a probability distribution on B. And so if the first probability distribution I called P, then the second one I would, would be our Q here. And so yes, that is one. And so then, okay. and so then, yeah. And so then, there's one consequence of this uh, inequality is that the entropy of the marginalized distribution, I guess that's what you call it, the resulting distribution, it has always got to be less than or equal to the pro the entropy of the original one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is a great example. Right. Of that. Okay. Uh huh. Thanks. I love it when I get questions I can actually answer, but, but, but feel free to ask a question. Uh, uh, some of these questions I'll definitely have to think about. I should have thought about how this is related to relative entropy, but I, I don't actually know uh, a way to relate it, uh, to see it as a special case of relative entropy. Uh, probably one of my co-authors would know. Um, okay, but I'm, I'm going to say like, okay, great. So we're trying to get some a uh, number that we can attach to a morphism in this category, FinProb, and here's how we're doing it. Now, look at this interesting observation that the entropy, it's incredibly simple observation, the entropy loss of a composite of two mor morphisms is just the entropy loss of one plus the entropy loss of the other. That depends on nothing at all about this function entropy. It's just that the, the, the change an entropy from the from the uh, initial probability dis distribution to the very last one is the change in the first step of the way plus the change in the second step of the way. You get this cancellation here. So we get the loss, entropy loss, uh, inverts composition of measure preserving maps to addition of natural, uh, of uh, non-negative real numbers. That looks like loss is being some kind of functor, right? A functor is supposed to preserve composition. And here it is preserving some kind of composition. Here is the composition in FinProb. Here is some kind of composition. Well, what is it? It's addition of non-negative real numbers. Can we make up a category where composition is addition of non-negative real numbers? Sure, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so. So yeah, so we'll, I'll explain how, but yeah, so information loss is a functor from FinProb to some category, which I'll tell you about in a second, which you can probably already guess, where the numbers from zero to infinity, not including infinity, are gonna be the morphisms and a composition of them is gonna be addition. I should also add that the entropy loss of an identity morphism is zero, right? That's the composite. Uh, functor also needs to preserve identity morphisms, and obviously the identity map doesn't change the entropy at all, so you'll get zero entropy loss. So that's good, because zero sounds like it's some kind of additive identity. And indeed, 
there's a category, which I'm just gonna boldly call zero infinity in the way that category theorists do, trampling on other people's notation, uh, to be a category with one object, I don't care what it's called, uh, and non-negative real numbers as morphisms, and then composition will be addition. You can, this is an example of a very general procedure for converting uh, monoids, as they're called, to categories with one object. Don't worry about that last remark if you don't like it. So, so what we've just noticed here is that entropy loss is indeed a functor from FinProb to this category zero infinity. So now the question becomes, if we so choose to ask it, is the, are there some conditions that uniquely characterize this functor? Or maybe let's be more cautious, let's characterize it up to some constant multiple. We could always multiply entropy loss by some constant and get another, another, another functor. Uh, and that would just be like changing the base in our logarithm. So we should not expect to characterize Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it looks like John is might be having a little technical problem. We'll just give him a, a, a minute or two to see if he can he can get back. Wait, I think maybe he's back. Okay, great. John, welcome back. My internet was playing tricks on me. It acted like it went dead. I went to, to the other room to check it out, and then it got bounced right back. So, sorry. Right. I, I noticed that that was happening. So I didn't like say tons of stuff that <laughs> you didn't hear. Uh, sorry for that. But at least I'm used to such disasters. Um, let's get back here. Right. So I was saying that a convex linear combination is a kind of linear combination where you're taking a linear combination of two things and the coefficients are some number between zero and one and one minus that number. Uh, so you can think of lambda as a probability and one minus lambda is the complementary probability. But this here we're doing something weird. We're taking convex linear combinations of objects in a category, which is a strange idea. Um, and so how does it work? I mean, defining it in some funny way. So this thing is supposed to be another object. So it's supposed to be a finite set with a probability distribution on it. So what's the finite set? The finite set will just be the disjoint union of these two sets, X and Y. And then what's the probability distribution on it? Well, you would sort of might say, well, I'll take the probability distribution P on the first set and Q on the second set, but that doesn't work because that wouldn't be a probability distribution. That would be a thing where the total probability is added up to two. But what you do is you do lambda times P on the first set and one minus lambda times Q on the second set. And then the probabilities add up to one. Um, so this is like a way of, this is a way of saying like, you know, you've got a probability distribution and another one, and we're gonna glom them together in a probability distribution on a bigger set but weighting the first ones by lambda and second ones by one minus lambda. If you think about it carefully, that's an example of this tree-shaped pattern that I've been talking about over and over again, where the first branch at the bottom of the tree is, are you gonna go for X or Y? And then you, and then you, given either one of those, you get a bunch of choices. Um, 
We can also define convex linear combinations of morphisms in this category. So if I've got a morphism and another morphism, I know this, this is like the scariest line in the whole darn talk. It's basically fluff, but <laughs> it, it's, I can take a convex linear combination of these morphisms. It's gonna go from the convex linear combination of the, of X comma P and Y comma Q to the convex linear combination of X prime P prime and Y prime Q prime. That's just saying what it's going from and to. And so what is it? Well, it's the most obvious thing in the world. It's just the function that equals F on the set X and G on the set Y. So it's saying like, if you're in the first set, do F. If you're in the second set, do G. So I'm just calling it a convex linear combination because that's what we called it when we were talking about objects, but, but we're, we're not really doing anything fancy with the functions f and g. We're just setting them side by side. Um, this is probably like the, maybe the hard, I believe this could be like the hardest thing to understand in the whole darn talk. Uh, it's not supposed to be hard to understand, but the whole talk is supposed to be really easy to understand. So this could be like the, the Mount Everest of incomprehensibility in this relatively flat uh, Kansas of a talk. So are there any questions about how, we're, how I'm defining convex linear combinations of objects or of morphisms in this category? Can someone ask a question or say something just to make sure that I'm actually connected to you? I'm, I'm losing my confidence. Yeah, we um, hear yeah. you. Okay, good, yeah. Okay, John, that makes me good. John, John there's a, there was a question in the chat about it, uh, generalizing this to uh, countable uh, as opposed to just oh. two. Um, oh, um, countable. Whew. Okay, uh, how about just like three? <laughs> so um, you could generalize. You could generalize. Notice I'm just dealing with finite sets because I'm giving a talk about category theory, and I never want to worry about whether a sum converges. I, that's like I can do analysis, but I'm I don't feel like doing it in this talk. So even countable sets would make me start having to think about a weeny teeny weeny bit of analysis because the entropy of a of a probability distribution on a countable set could be infinite. So I'd have to like think a little bit harder. Um, but basically the answer is, I'm sure that all of this stuff could be generalized. You could generalize the heck out of this stuff to arbitrary measure spaces and try to replace this uh, convex linear combination concept to one that was like two choices, but by like a whole probability, a whole measure space of choices where you put a probability measure on that. So yeah, um, I don't know if- so I, meant, I meant something slightly different. Oh, okay. Um, what? Sorry. So I, I, I asked the question, and what I meant is um, that it's important that X and Y are finite sets, because I was a bit worried about multiplying probability densities rather than probabilities. But now that I think about it more, maybe that doesn't matter at all. Um, I'll talk a little, I'll just point out without attempting to explain, because I haven't studied them carefully, some papers that generalize this result that I'm aiming for to more general measure spaces. And so then that those would be the places to look to like see how to push this, push this idea. One thing I've learned, which took me a while to learn, is that see, I come from a background in analysis. My my like my PhD thesis was on analysis. And so I, I used to think that like anything that was just involving finite sums was like pathetic. And uh, but but as I've gotten more into category theory, I've learned that there's a huge benefit to like sketching out ideas in like this simple case. And then, then you sort of hope that, that you can like uh, generalize later. And usually you can, I mean, well, you can't always, but that's like a separate project. So here I'm doing like the first, the babies, the finite case stuff. Yeah, um, right. So now here's the cool thing. You can show just by a calculation that entropy loss, this functor we were talking about, is convex linear in the following sense that, so if I take a convex linear combination of morphisms and compute its entropy loss, that I get the convex linear combination of those numbers, the entropy loss of F and the entropy loss of G. 
this this equation is the prototype of what's called convex linearity. It's linearity, but for convex linear combinations. So that's an interesting property of entropy loss. Um, and it's easy to prove. Well, it's easy to prove if you believe the chain rule. So remember, I said that this, uh, that this, Sorry, how to, how, to, how to say this. Yeah, Let, focus not on entropy loss, but just on entropy. So the entropy of a convex linear combination of finite sets with probability measures, I mentioned that when you're, when you're considering such a thing, you can think of that as an instance of this tree-like pattern, where first you have a binary alternative. Am I gonna be in the set X or am I gonna be in the set Y? And then the set X, gives you a bunch of alternatives with a probability distribution on them and ditto for y. So you can compute the entropy of the whole uh, resulting probability distribution using the chain rule. And it will be the entropy of the first binary alternative, which is has these two choices with these two probabilities, plus the weighted average of the entropies of the various, uh, well, in this case, the two, the two, uh, probability measures that you're, that you're, that you're uh, glomming together. So the chain rule gives you this. So this is a formula for the entropy of the uh, initial probability distribution. See, we've got this morphism from some probability, from fun, some finite set with probability distribution to another one. So I'm saying we can, we can work out the entropy of this one. That's what I just did. And in an exactly analogous way, we can work out the entropy of this one. The entropy loss will be the difference of those two. But when we take the difference of those two expressions, this extra term here cancels out. And so you just get uh, lambda times the entropy loss of the first function plus one minus lambda times the entropy loss of the second. So, so this convex linearity is also um, has within it some uh, aspect of the chain rule. Um, and then finally, these categories that I was calling fin prob and zero infinity, they're what are called topological categories, or you could say categories in, internal to the category of topological spaces. That just means that these they actually have a topological space of objects and a topological space of morphisms and composition of morphisms is continuous. So the topology on zero infinity is all pretty trivial. I mean, not trivial, but it's well understood. Uh, the topology on FinProb is that you, th you think of a, the, the, the topology is just the usual topology on the set of different probability distributions on the same set. So, so different sets count as like this very different, uh, points in the space of objects. But once you have a particular set, then it will have lots of different prob probability distributions on it. And so we get an interesting topology on them, which is just the usual topology on the space of probability distributions on a finite set. And so, so these are topological categories and loss is a continuous functor meaning that it's continuous on objects and it's continuous on morphisms. Just to mention for those of you who love category theory, this is a little taste of what's called internal category theory. You can define categories internal to a given category. So ordinary categories, ordinary small categories are internal to set because you have a set of objects and a set of all morphisms for such a category. Uh, but, but you could say, ah, I wanna do a weird kind of category where I've got like a vector space of objects and a vector space of morphisms. And that turns out to be a very interesting thing to study. And here anyway, we're considering a, a category internal to topological spaces. Um, right. So the theorem is that Tom and Tobias and I proved is this, that any continuous 
convex linear functor from fin prob to this category I'm calling zero infinity is a constant multiple of entropy loss. So in other words, for any morphism, this functor must assign to it some constant times the entropy loss. So this is, this is sort of a beautiful uh, packaging of Fadeyev's theorem. When you dig into what this theorem says and try to actually prove it, this is like one of those category theory theorems where you like unwrap it and then you see, oh, it's not such a big deal after all. Well, what you see is that it's Fadeyev's theorem, which is a big deal, I guess, but it's, it's, it reduces down to that. Um, so I'll just say like, there's one super easy part of the proof, which is that it's pretty easy to show that any functor into zero infinity uh, has got to be of the form it's uh, if G is a morphism from some object to some object, it's got to be a, a difference of, of some function on objects. Um, so then once you know that, then you just have to prove that that function really is a constant of the usual times the usual Shannon entry. And so you, you sort of focus on this function phi, and then you show that the conditions of being continuous and convex linear uh, give you, can be, can be used to get a hold of the conditions of Fadev's theorem. And so that this thing must be a constant on Shannon entry. Okay, so that's, that's, our, that's our theorem. And I guess I'll say that there may be some category theory lovers in the audience that, um, so I mentioned that categories internal to topological spaces, um, but in fact, what we're, this fact that we're, we're also talking about a convex linear functor between categories which have a concept of convex linear combination of objects and morphisms uh, means that we're also dealing with categories internal to convex spaces. So there's a concept called a convex space, which is a kind of set equipped with operations of convex linear combination obeying some reasonable axioms. So, so really what I'm talking about here are categories internal to convex topological spaces, i.e. topological spaces with a convex structure. And, and then this functor is a functor internal to convex topological spaces. So the topology in this game only plays the role of ruling out weird mutant versions of the logarithm function that obey the properties of the logarithm function but aren't the usual logarithm function. The convexity is much more important. Uh, Sam, I think there have been a couple of questions here. I, so I'll do Sam because he's on top, but I don't know if he was first, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering if um, you could say anything more about the topology of this category of finite probability distributions. Like, is there anything you could say about like its connected components or anything like that that would make this theorem like have more intuitive meaning? Sure. Yeah, I tried to say it, but I said it very awkwardly. So, so it'll have one. So that, let's look at the set of. I mean. So remember, a topological a category in, in topological spaces, it'll have a topological space of objects and a topological space of morphisms. So let's focus on the space of objects because that's actually sort of weirder. Um, so so if each finite set gives you a component. And then in that connected component, you get all the different probability distributions on that finite set. And, and there's a sort of obvious, I hope, prob uh, topology on the set of probability distributions on a finite set, because it's just a subset of Rn if your set has n elements. 
So you get all these components, one for every finite set in the world, <laughs> which is a lot, uh, and and then a, a subset of Rn for each one of those. And for those of you who are like real nitpickers, you'll notice there's not even a set of finite sets. It's, there are too many finite sets for there to be a set of all of them. Uh, so if you don't like proper classes or growth in the universes or something like that, you should just like work with the skeleton of the category of finite sets. So just work with the finite sets, the, uh, the one finite set for each natural number. Um, Seth? Thanks. Um, Thanks. You, men you mentioned um, just a minute or two ago, we're ruling out things that sort of behave like log or you know, x log x yeah. are pathological functions. Right. Uh, I'm having a hard time thinking. Can you give an example of what one of those weird things would be? I think it would give more content to this to realize like, you know, what continuity or some of these other assumptions are doing for us. Well, the really interesting thing is that I could the the other examples can only be quote constructed using the axiom of choice. So there's a there's a beautiful theorem that says that suppose like, yes. for example, a function that has the property that f of x times y is equal to f of x plus f of y for x and y being like positive numbers, right? So f obeys this equation, f of x times y is f of x plus f of y. That's sort of the characteristic equation you expect of the logarithm. So you expect solutions that are like any multiple of the natural logarithm. And then the if you believe in the axiom of choice, there are lots of other functions obeying that equation. But I can't show you any one of them because I can only construct them using the axiom of choice. So if you if you believe in there's like a there's like a version of of math where you can do a lot of analysis where you assume the uh, the the opposite of the axiom of choice. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting. Oh yeah, Solovey's model of ZF plus the, con the, con the negation of the axiom of choice. And in that version of set theory, you can show that there aren't any other function, any other functions like this except for the logarithm. So basically it's just like a completely irritating issue for, for anyone wanting to do anything practical. Uh, and we could actually reduce this continuity condition down to something more like a measurability condition. So if you, so your, your question is very similar to asking me to like give you an example of a non-measurable function on the real numbers. And I could like describe how to get one using the axiom of choice, but I can't really give it to you in any concrete way. So there's sort of, my thesis advisor, Irving Siegel said all those other solutions are, they're like phantoms. You don't like really need to worry about them. <laughs> if you just be, don't be scared of ghosts. Um, Duggan, probably mispronouncing your name, but uh, you're not, you're muted, I think, or I can't hear you anyway. How's this? Yeah. All right. The name's Dugan. Um, okay, sorry. On the linear interpolation between uh, probability distributions like on X and Y, um, does that not require any? function from f to y, not like interpolating a push forward, you're just interpolating between x and p and y and q. I don't understand why you're calling that interpolation. Oh. Uh, I'm not, I don't think of this as anything like interpolation. I have, no, I have a probability distribution on x and a function, and I get a probability distribution on y. And then I say that f is a morphism from x comma p to y comma q. I meant the definition uh, a few slides past this about this direction. No, the lambda. The oh, this, this, this. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, that. So, so yeah. it's called convex linear combination, but it's funny, right? Because this new thing is a probability distribution on the disjoint union of x and y. Right. And it's just some multiple of p on x and some other multiple of q on y. So I don't, I wouldn't want to call that interpolation, but it's like, it's some kind of, basically you flip a coin with 
probability lambda and if you get, if it's heads up you say oh, okay i'm going to go for an alternative in the set x and if it's tails up i'll go for one in y yeah so so that definition doesn't like require like any map f from x to y no no they're just completely separate things okay that's what i thought and then but for the second one the second one's even more stupid the second one is you just got a function from x to x prime a function from y to y prime and this thing though it has this grandiose looking name it's just the function that equals f if you're in this set and it's equals g and if you're in this set so there's no linear combination stuff actually going on to define this function despite its name the only reason why i'm giving it this name is that is that then what we know is that we have operations that we're calling convex linear combination both on objects and on morphisms and they play along well to each other which which you show off and you say, we've got a category internal to convex sets, meaning that you can take convex linear combinations of objects and morphisms and it all hangs together in a nice way. So it's just uh, pushing forward uh, a combination, convex combination of, of X and Y to X prime and Y prime. Along exactly. Yeah, yep, that's okay. exactly right. Um, I am... I'm beginning to run out of time. Uh, if you can stand it, Morris, I would like to. Oh, ask your question. Okay, you you. Well, so I was wondering. So in physics, when you talk about energy, it sort of um, it is relative. Basically, what matters is the change of energy or like the difference. Right. And and you also recover uh, the difference of entropy, sort of really speaking, not the entropy itself. And is there any sense in which this suggests that the difference of entropies is more important than the actual entropy itself? Um, I'm going to refuse to answer such a philosophical question at this point in my life, meaning like 10 minutes from trying to finish a talk. But sure. <laughs> I mean, I, that's an attitude we're sort of taking years that we're like focusing on the morphisms. Yeah. But I don't, I wouldn't die for that point of view. Yeah. If someone held me up to the wall with a gun and asked if I think the change in entropy is more open strict. Yeah. It's an interesting question. I don't know how much to say about it. Um, okay. So first I want to cover some, discuss some other papers connected to this idea, generalizations. So one interesting thing is that you can think of this category as a category internal to convex sets, as I described. But in fact, there's a one parameter family of ways to do so. And we just picked the obvious one, but there are a lot of other non-obvious ones. And for each one, there is a entropy loss functor that, uh, oh, and that Q should have been alpha. <laughs> um, for each choice of alpha, you get an entropy loss functor that is continuous and convex linear. And it is this, it is the entropy loss or change in entropy defined using this other kind of entropy, solace entropy. So what's good about solace entropy from this point of view is that, is that there are other alternative concepts of the convex structure on this category here. So this is in our, our paper, Tobias and Tom and I. Um, other issues. So and I really think of relative entropy as more fundamental than entropy. Actually, if I had to like answer Morris's question by changing the question, I, I, would, I would argue that like relative entropy is more fundamental than entropy. Um, there you have two probability distributions on a finite set in this case. And this is the expected amount of information you gain when you thought the probability distribution was Q and you discovered that it was P, roughly speaking. Um, so uh, after this first paper, Tobias and I wrote a second paper where we give a category theoretic characterization of relative entropy. The second paper was a lot harder, <laughs> a lot more technical. Uh, the, pr the proof was more technical. Um, and then luckily later, Tom gave a simplified proof in the special case where Q being zero at some point implies P being zero at some point, 
Tobias and I spent a huge amount of work, and I should say it was mainly Tobias, who was persistent enough to handle the case when Q is zero and P is not zero. Then you're dividing by zero, and then we say the relative entropy is infinite. Well, yeah, right. Um, and so we had to, we wanted to allow that case, uh, but that just like gave us an, uh, an analysis problem that's more difficult. So anyway, it becomes easier if you dodge that case. Um, now, relative entropy also generalizes nicely to arbitrary measurable spaces, or say relatively nice measurable spaces, uh, where you use the radone nicodeme derivative as the uh, kind of ratio of probability measures if mu is absolutely continuous with respect to nu. So Nicholas Gagné and uh, Prakash Panangadan generalized our characterization of relative entropy to this case. They needed to use mildly nice uh, probability measure spaces or measurable spaces called standard Borel spaces. Uh, basically, most of the probability measure spaces you normally want to study in life are of that type. Um, and I, there was some question that sort of raised the issue of quantum mechanics, although the question wasn't really about mainly about quantum mechanics, but you could ask, can you generalize this stuff to uh, quantum mechanics? And Arthur Parzignat has uh, indeed um, <clears throat> generalized the category theoretic characterization of Shannon entropy to that case, where it's called von Neumann entropy. And now he's working toward a characterization of the quantum version of relative entropy. And on Friday, he's going to give a talk about, about this set of ideas. So I'm looking forward to hearing that. I don't really know much about this at all. Um, also, another direction to go in is, as I mentioned, that these, these tree-like pictures should remind you of operads, at least if you ever heard of operads. <laughs> this is like the one thing you should know about operads is that they're, if, if you only know one thing, which is that they're like a formalism for dealing with n area operations where the ways you can compose them are in these tree-like patterns. So it's a very general formulation for n area operations. Uh, and it was actually Tom's thoughts on operads that led him to this whole circle of ideas, which then we stripped of its operad content in our paper. Uh, but, but he has a, had this nice blog article that he wrote back in 2011 when we were working on this stuff, where he explained it, the, uh, a characterization of Shannon entropy in the language of operads, which is basically equivalent to what I stated in, in, in my theorem with Tobias and Tom, but phrased in a quite different sounding language of operands. And now that's a great lead in for the next talk today because Ty Dene Bradley has recently given another characterization of Shannon entropy using operands, uh, describing it as a derivation of a topological operand, which is a concept that you'll explain, I assume. And and this derivation property is another way of thinking about the chain rule. So while I call it the chain rule, if you go back and look at it, it might, it might sort of remind you of the product rule. I mean, <laughs> it's not really like any normal calculus rule. But, sorry, my screen is freezing up. But, but you'll notice that the entropy here involves a sum of, of entropies over all the terms. And we're doing something that's sort of like multiplying. So you could call this like a product rule. And, and Ty Dene will make that very, uh, very clear. And of course, the fancy word for product rule is derivation. A thing obeying the product rule is a derivation. So she'll discuss that. Uh, so those are the, the different generalizations that I'm aware of that we'll talk about. I should add that my uh, grad student, Owen Lynch, is talking on Friday as well. And he'll be talking about some joint work where uh, we um, use this formalism of convex spaces to study entropy of many different kinds um, and thermodynamics for many different kinds of entropy. So he, I never really said exactly what I mean by a convex space. I said it's like a, some kind of set where you can take convex linear combinations and they obey some familiar rules, but I didn't say what those rules were. 
I believe he will tell you what they are. Uh, so he'll actually tell you what a convex space is. And I haven't really worked at all to try to understand how the stuff he's talking about is connected to this, <laughs> but it has to be. So I'll stop here. And as you see, there's like lots of other things that one could dig into in this direction. So thanks very much. Thanks, John. Um, that was great. Uh, so, uh, and also thanks to all the participants for um, raising your hands and, and asking questions. There, we have time for maybe um, one more and then we're gonna take, take a break until three o'clock uh, before Ty Danae starts her talk. Um, well, okay, maybe there's no, no questions now. So we'll just uh, take a break now um, and uh, see you at three o'clock. We'll, we'll start right at 3.01. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Hi, Bye. welcome back everyone. Um, so uh, one thing I could have said at the very, very beginning was, was I wanted to thank, and I forgot, um, the Moore Foundation for, for supporting the symposia series. Um, so uh, our next speaker is, is Ty Danae Bradley, um, a, uh, a really great mathematician who, as I, as I said before, also a gifted communicator. Um, we're happy to have her here in, in person um, from the, uh, her positions as a professor at the Masters University and uh, at Sandbox AQ. Uh, she's here to talk to us about operads and entropy. And um, just a, a comment for everyone, uh, the way our setup is working is, uh, it's a little hard to monitor the chat. So if you just have a question, if you raise your hand um, and uh, Titan will call on you and, 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 and answer your question. Um, uh, that way. So, uh, tight in a breath. Thank you. All right. Excellent. Um, so thank you all for being here, both in person and virtually on Zoom and those who may um, watch the recording later. And thanks so much to John Torilla for organizing this workshop and this symposium into John Baez for the nice talk um, that we just had. So um, some housekeeping, I can't actually see anyone on Zoom, uh, nor can I see if you raise your hand. So I, I can tell you. So someone just do something and let me know if there's a question and then I'd be happy to try to answer it. Okay, so um, here's a picture of entropy. Um, I've, I've illustrated it as a lovely, beautiful gem with many facets. And in this talk, what I would like to do is to rotate this gem in different ways and discuss different facets of entropy. Some sides of this gem I will spend more time on than others, and you've got a sneak preview of that in John's talk. Um, others, I'm really not an expert, and so I'll just flash it to you quickly and then move on to something else. But I want to say some things also for the record, because I think it's really interesting. Um, I chose this approach because there's so much that I want to say, and I don't really know how to put, to get, put it together in a cohesive way, but I feel that everything is kind of connected. So this is my analogy. It could backfire, but we'll see. So this is the game plan. OK, so um, let's jump in sort of by way of review. When I say the word entropy in this talk, um, I do mean Shannon entropy. So we just saw a basic definition of that. But for those who are maybe um, miss John Baez's talk or are tuning in or watching this at a later time, um, I really mean the Shannon entropy associated to a probability distribution on a finite set X, which is given by this formula that uh, we're familiar with. Um, the log of each of the probabilities weighted by those probabilities, add them all together with a minus sign to make this quantity non-negative. Um, and as we've heard, one way that you can think of Shannon entropy is like a measure of surprise. So the example that, that we all have in mind is if I flip a fair coin with heads and tails, 
what's the entropy of that probability distribution one half one half well it's log of two which is non-negative and the takeaway is oh i'm positively surprised or i learned some information when the coin landed on heads but if my coin if both sides are heads the the probability distribution is just one comma zero the entropy of that is zero, meaning, oh, my coin, it landed on heads. I've gained no information. I'm not surprised. Entropy is zero. Okay, so I went through that quickly because um, we're familiar with it. But let me give you a slightly tidier way to write entropy. Not really tidier, but I, well, I'm going to make a small cosmetic change. So um, if we define a function on the unit interval, I'll call it D that's valued in reals. D of A is minus A log A whenever A is positive and it's zero otherwise. These are just the sum ends in the formula for entropy. I can write entropy in terms of this function D. It's just I apply D to each probability and then add them all up. Okay, big deal. Why do that? Well, I think the interesting observation that one can make is that D satisfies a formula that is familiar. Um, looks like the product rule from calculus. So if I take D of two numbers, A times B, um, you can show with arithmetic, that's D of A times B plus A times D of B for all numbers A and B. Okay, so as John Baez mentioned, anytime you have a function that satisfies something like the product rule or the Leibniz rule from calculus, you call this function a derivation. And it's, it's a nonlinear derivation in this case. It's easy to check. Um, all right, why do that? Well, I mean, you could ask, oh, can I take this a step further? Can I, you know, pull the D out of the summation and express entropy as D of something? Well, no, I mean, we just said it's not linear. You can check that. And so maybe that was a silly question, but maybe not because um, we may wonder, is there some sense in which entropy itself is D of something or is there something more going on? Why is it that the product rule should ap appear in this, in this discussion of entropy at even such a basic level? So that's a little bit of motivation. This is like one facet of entropy. Something called a derivation applies in this sort of elementary expression that you have. That's all you want to say about that. And I want to take our gym and look at another facet. But you can put that in your back pocket. Okay, what's the next facet I want to chat about for a little bit? Well, it's something that we're familiar with now from John Baez's talk. So I would like to now say a few more words about the chain rule. Um, now, if you are here in this room, or you're on Zoom and you just heard the talk, you are an expert in the chain rule, but maybe it doesn't hurt to hear things more than one time. And, and I'd like to say a few words about the chain rule, just you know, for the sake of completeness uh, for this recording. So what's the chain rule? Well, you've seen an example. I'm going to give you another one. Speaking of coins, imagine I flip a coin. It's got heads or tails, a fair coin. And let's say, deciding on which face the coin lands, I'm gonna think about what to have for breakfast or lunch. Well, we just had lunch, so suppose I'll do this tomorrow. So if my coin lands on heads, there's a 50% chance. Let's say I'll choose one of three options for, for breakfast with different probabilities. I'll choose cereal, probability two-fifths, oatmeal one-half, fruit one-tenth. And I'm gonna call that new probability distribution Q. On the other hand, if my coin lands on tails with probability half, I'll choose two things for lunch, either pizza or stir fry. I like stir fry, so I'll give it a higher probability. And I'm gonna call this probability distribution R. Okay, here's the takeaway. This two-step process, flip a coin and then think about food, defines a new probability distribution on the five food options. So the total, the, the final outcome of this process, I'm gonna eat something with a certain probability. So, and how do I get those probabilities? I just multiply, right? So if I flip heads and then choose fruit, the probability of that happening is one half probability of heads times one tenth the probability of choosing fruit. And then I can do this for the other options too. I just kind of multiply these numbers through. 
I flip tails and choose stir fry, that's one half times seven to me. You can see my mouse. Okay, so we've kind of seen already that writing all of this out is a little cumbersome. I don't wanna write this, this thumbs up with the flip on every slide. So I'm gonna clean this picture up a little bit. So I imagine I have this you know, incoming operation and it branches off into two choices and each of those two choices branches off into three or two. So I'm gonna take this picture and just rotate it you know, by 90 degrees. Okay, and there it is. So here's this tree picture that we saw earlier. We can think of probability distribution on two elements, the coin flip, one half, one half is a tree with two leaves. My breakfast distribution is a tree with three leaves. I'll call it Q in green. Similarly for my probability distribution on two lunch items. And on top here, I'm showing you my new probability distribution on five elements. And all of these numbers here are just given by multiplying the respective probabilities along the leaves, following a path in this this composite tree. And the notation, it'll be convenient to have notation for this new composite distribution. Um, we saw it earlier, and so I'm gonna reuse it here. We'll denote it by P composed with Q and R. P is the coin flip, Q is breakfast, R is lunch. Um, okay, now there is a sort of um, more holistic way of thinking about this. And now topological simplicities come into the picture. Why? What is really a probability distribution on a finite set? It's basically by definition, a point in an n minus one simplex, or we can say an n minus one simplex is the set of all probability distributions on n elements. Um, when you think about what that means, it's just, just a subset of Rn. So put the standard topology on it and you get a space. So um, it will be more convenient to do a little bit of re-indexing. So usually topological simplices are denoted by delta to the n minus one. This is the space of all distributions on n elements. But look, that's kind of inconvenient, right? So let's break tradition and let's write delta lower n. Yeah, delta lower n to denote the space of distributions on n elements. But here are the pictures. A zero simplex is a point. That's like the probability distribution on a single element. A line is a one simplex, the space of all distributions on two elements. But I'm gonna re-index and then lower that exponent. Why did I say that? Because the point is that multiplying probabilities in this way gives us functions on simplices, right? So I, I've described for you a way to take a triple of probability distributions from the respective topological simplices and compose them to get a new point in a new simplex whose you know, dimension is like the sum of the Q and the R, the sum of the number of total leaves that I have here. So this is interesting because now um, you can ask, what is the Shannon entropy of this new composite Distribution. There's a question. There's a, there's a, a question from uh, Jan. Okay. Hi. Yes. Uh, uh, hi. Um, uh, can we generalize this if the n elements are correlated with each other? In this case, I think you, you're assuming they're uncorrelated. Like the, the food options, I choose them, one is independent of the other, but usually that's not the case. Like if you had fruit in the morning, it's unlikely you're going to pick fruit for, for lunch. So is there any, any way to generalize this formalism? Um, so because this is general and because this holds for any probability distributions, well, I haven't gotten to that yet, but it will, um, then it should be fine if your distributions are not independent. But I want to make a statement about those which are. And then if you'd like to put assumptions on them, um, Maybe you can say a little bit more, uh, but I don't okay. have results that come to mind immediately about that. But for right now, you're right. I'm not making any assumptions about the dependence on, on them. Yeah, thank you for the question. But, uh, uh, wait, wait, but I think you do, because when you multiply the probabilities, 
multiplying the probabilities, uh, if you go to the slides with the, with the to multiply the probabilities for one, what you had for lunch and what you had for, for breakfast. So you, by multiplying them, you assume that they're independent, they're not correlated. Yes. So that assumption is implicit in there. That's what I'm trying, but. Um, oh. Yeah, so that's correct. Yeah, I don't know if there's, I don't know if there's a, a statement. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's okay. That's what I want to work with now. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so, so I have this way to combine these, these probability distributions. And for now, we'll say that they, we, we have this assumption on them. Um, and I'd like to know what's the entropy of this. And as we saw earlier, this is precisely the chain rule that we heard. So what's the, the Shannon entropy of P composed with Q and R? I mean, yes, we have a formula for it, but you may wonder, can I write the entropy of this larger composite distribution in terms of the entropies of the individual distributions? So the answer is yes. It's the entropy of the first, the sort of bottom tree, P, plus a weighted sum of the entropies of the trees on top. Uh, where those weights are precisely the corresponding probabilities on the leaves of the initial tree. So one half, that's flipping heads, then multiply it by the, the entropy of the distribution that I have when I think about what happens when I flip heads. And similarly for, for the next term. Um, more generally though, we also saw that this is, there's nothing special about you know, breakfast, lunch, and coins. Anytime I have a probability distribution on n elements, I can draw this as a tree uh, with three leaves, but n, n leaves. Um, I can compose or sort of graft in these trees. These correspond to different probability distributions, Q1, Q2, up to Qn. I can use this similar notation, this circle notation, and ask for the entropy of this larger composite probability distribution that you obtain by multiplying probabilities in this way. And so it's the chain rule, again, the entropy of the first plus a weighted sum of the entropies of the trees on top. And then this is very straightforward to check. It's like arithmetic, it follows from properties of logarithm, or if you like, recall that we can write entropy in terms of this derivation function Recall what a derivation is, and this may save you a few lines in your proof, but it's all straightforward. So let me now take a step back and just kind of put all of this together. So usually, maybe when we think of entropy, we think of a number. But really, Shannon entropy defines a sequence of infinitely many real valued functions on topological simplices. And moreover, you can kind of convince yourself that these functions are continuous. If I think of a simplex as a subset of Euclidean space, if I change my probabilities a little bit, then entropy will change just a little bit too. Log is continuous. So Shannon entropy, now I wanna think of Shannon entropy, not just as a number associated to a distribution. I really wanna think of entropy as defining the sequence of functions on simplices valued in the reals. This is Shannon entropy, but moreover, these functions satisfy the chain rule. Okay, this is interesting for at least two reasons some of which we heard already, but let me just say this explicitly. First of all, let's look at the chain rule. There it is. Um, if you were to kind of squint your eyes and look at it from a distance and you ignore the summation and you ignore the indices and blah, 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 this kind of looks like the entropy of two things is the entropy of the first plus the first times the entropy of the second. Very roughly, if you like squint and ignore all of the details. Um, okay, and you know what that looks like. That kind of looks like the product rule, except that there's 
uh, you know, this white dot missing on the right hand side. So now I just put it in there. So there it is. Okay, so that's interesting. The chain rule looks like the product rule or the Leibniz rule from calculus. This is the first point I want to make. And the second reason why the chain rule is interesting is because it is the most important algebraic property of Shannon entropy, according to Tom Linster in his excellent book, which we've heard about already called Entropy and Diversity. Why is it called an algebraic property? Because you're taking probability distributions and combining them to get a new one. This is like algebra. Um, and Tom says it's the most important one. And you already heard why uh, John Baez mentioned it, but here I'm saying it again. Um, there's a very nice theorem in Tom's book, Entropy and Diversity, um, where he proves that actually continuity and the chain rule are enough to characterize Shannon entropy. John Baez mentioned this in his talk, but here I have a screenshot of the theorem. Um, as John mentioned, this is like a variation of a 1956 theorem by Fedayev. Um, actually, you'll notice there's only two conditions. So the theorem says, if you have a sequence of real valued functions on topological simplices, they're continuous and they satisfy the chain rule, then you can conclude your sequence is really just entropy up to some constant. So notice there's not even the statement about needing uh, invariant under bijections. Actually, if you read Tom's book, you can see you can do away with that. And this is enough because the chain rule is more general than the original version that I have considered. Okay, great. So anytime I have a sequence of functions, basically the chain rule is like, you know, this DNA of entropy. It's like it's fingerprint. So that's one reason why I think this is, this is really neat. But also, as John Baez mentioned, around 2010 or so, approximately 10 years ago or more, um, Tom Linster gave a different characterization of entropy in terms of something called operads. We've heard the word, I will get to the definition, but I just wanna say there exists another characterization using an abstract tool called an operad. I will not tell you what that characterization is, but it requires because it requires me to tell you more words and definitions that I won't use later. The reason I mentioned this though is because at the same time, at the same time that Tom Linster was working on his operatic characterization, as you just heard John Bias said, the motivation for um, coming up with this category theoretical characterization of entropy in terms of information loss was to kind of strip the operad, you know details away. Um, but this is all kind of happening at the same time. So if you go online to the ncatlab.org, you will see a really nice blog post by John Baez called Entropy as a Functor. And in that blog post, he talks about this kind of interesting glomming together of probability distributions. Um, he talks about Tom Linster's operatic characterization of it and how it fits into Fedayev's theorem. And he also makes this observation that we just talked about, that the chain rule looks like a derivation. It looks like the product rule. And in this blog post from 2010, John Baez asked, how does the derivation way of thinking about the chain rule relate to Tom, Tom Linster's operatic interpretation or version of it? Okay, so you can read this now, not now. After the talk, you can read this. And then it's like, there's no answer. Oh, it was a puzzle. I read it. I thought it was really interesting. You know, are these things related? And if so, how? So first of all, are they, are they related? And the answer is yes. And so this is a paper that came out last year. The chain rule really is the product rule or the Leibniz rule in disguise. So, you know, if, if you are upset that it's called the chain rule, you can now confidently say we should rename it the product rule because it's really that's what's going on. And how can we see that? Well, now, turns out there is a correspondence between Shannon entropy and derivations of a certain operad. Now I need to explain to you what that is. So what's really going on here? What's an operad? What's a derivation of one? What's this correspondence? And like, who cares? Why care? We care because we're here. Um, but I think this could be potentially interesting 
for those who don't yet know that they should care and maybe um, there might be some interesting connections elsewhere. Um, so I'm gonna now give the highlights. So this is the end of one facet of entropy. That's the chain rule. Now I wanna rotate this lovely gym and look at another facet and that's from the perspective of operad. So I have to introduce this to you now. And I'm only gonna give you the highlights because um, I think it's not as exciting if I show you a whole bunch of formulas and stuff. So I'll give you kind of the big ideas. And then if you're interested, hopefully that'll be enough to learn more. Question from the audience. Um, do you have an intuition for um, why that single characterization implies Oh, okay. The question, yeah, the question for the Zoom audience, uh, the question asked was asked, do I have an intuition for why um, this more general version of the chain rule lets you do away with this other axiom of invariance under bijection? Um, I don't. I don't, but I will say that Tom says explicitly why in his book, and I just don't remember at this time. Yeah, thank you for the question. Good one. Other questions before I turn to another facet of entropy, either on Zoom or in person? No? Okay, good. So what's an operad? Well, the title of this workshop and symposium is Categorical Semantics of Entropy. So let me introduce operads by saying something about categories. So what's a category? I think you're all experts, but let me just say what you know already. A category consists of some objects, call them X and Y, and morphisms between them. And moreover, if the domain and codomains of morphisms match up, you can compose them. They have a notion of composition. So you have a notion of composition. Um, and you ask that that be associative. What else do you have in a category? Well, for each object, you X, you would like there to be a special morphism from X to itself called the identity. You make sense of that. Um, so this is the, the basic ingredients of a category. Okay, but of course, if I have an object X, I can also consider, you know, other morphisms to and from it other endomorphisms maybe that aren't the identity. Now, think about this. If you're, suppose that X is a set, okay? And this arrow is a function. If I take a set X, I can certainly take the Cartesian product of X with itself multiple times. And I can look at functions out of that Cartesian product back into X, right? Or in general, if I have any category with finite products or a monoidal category, even maybe a symmetric monoidal category, some category where I have a notion of, you know, multiplying objects together, I can consider maps on products of that object of itself back to itself. And if I consider morphisms that have this kind of flavor, I can, you know, do this again. I can compose that. So if I have an a morphism from three copies of X to itself, I can use the output of that morphism as the input of another morphism of like N copies of X with itself. Uh, but I can do this, you know, on any one of the inputs of my morphism. So this is certainly something you can do. Maybe these are sets or topological spaces or vector spaces. The point is, why am I doing this? This is, seems kind of, yeah, sure we can do this, but why? Well, an, op an operad generalizes or abstracts this idea, okay? So you see the tree picture, which is starting to look familiar. Operads abstract away the sort of concrete operations here, and they view these trees and this idea in a much more abstract way. So if you do that and you look at compositions, this, this is what an operad is, intuitively. So let me give you the actual definition. <clears throat> What is an operad? An operad O consists of a collection of sets indexed by the natural numbers. 
Um, typically, the indexing starts at zero, but it'll be convenient in this talk to begin at one. So O of one is a set, O of two is a set, O of three is a set, et cetera. But you want to think of elements in, in this set as abstract operations of a certain arity. So here I have a picture of O of four, and I wanna think of elements in the set O of four as abstract operations of arity four. So just things that have four inputs and one output, which are conveniently drawn as trees, planar rooted trees. So don't think of this tree here as a function. Don't think of it that way. It's just an abstract thing. Okay, what else do you have? Well, you would like a way to compose these abstract operations. So in other words, if I have a binary operation, two inputs and one output, I should be able to use that output and plug it in to one of the four inputs of this original tree that I had, right? I have four ways that I can plug it in. So once I fix one of these inputs, once I sort of graft my tree with two leaves into this bottom tree, um, I've got a new operation that has four plus two inputs minus one, minus one because I fixed it. So this is what this is saying here on the left-hand side. So you have these sets of, op of operations of arity in indexed by the natural numbers together with ways to compose them. So in other words, um, I'm denoting this by circle I. So I indexes from one to N. So in other words, if I take a tree with N leaves and I take another tree with M leaves, I can graph that second tree onto any one of the end leaves of the first. So there are n ways to do that, which is why i ranges from one to n. So this is what you ask, a way to do this. And then moreover, just like in categories, right, you'd like, um, you, I don't know why my font just changed, but it's the same thing. Sorry, this, the size changed. But you'd also like a special element, a unary element <clears throat> that's called the identity. But how do you know it's the identity? Well, you have some axioms. And you'd also like this composition to satisfy associativity. So the, this identity is, it is what you think it is. If I have, you know, a tree with two leaves on top and an identity, I can kind of sort of stick it on any one of the two leaves and it doesn't change. Or I can stick the identity on the root and it doesn't change. That's the identity. What do we mean by associativity? What does it mean for composition of abstract operations? to be associative. Well, turns out you can kind of anticipate this. To write that down would be horrendous. It's terrible. Um, probably you don't wanna do it in a talk, but, but um, if you're interested to read more, maybe you should have a little taste <laughs> so that it won't be too bad when you read it. So this is like notoriously yucky to write down, but I'll give you a picture for it, okay? So what does it mean to have, to ask for associativity? Associativity means I'm gonna have three trees. So here's a picture of one, Q, P, and R. So associativity means, look, I have the pink tree. I can graph the blue tree on it. And then I can graph the green tree. Or I start with the pink tree. And first I can graph the green tree and then the blue one. And you ask that it doesn't matter, that those should be equal. But then there's something else to consider because what if I have a picture like this? Okay, how would you construct this tree? Well, you can start with the pink one and then graph the blue and then graph R on top of that thing. Or separately, you can start with the blue tree over here, stick R on top of it, and then take that whole thing and graft it onto the pink. And then you ask that those are equal. It shouldn't matter. And then there's another option that maybe you're thinking about, which is basically like the reverse of the first option. It's the same thing. What if you graft blue on the left of green? So you ask that all of these things be 
you know, the first picture doesn't matter how you can arrive at it, same with the second two. But you can imagine there's all of these cases, right? And it's a little bit yucky to write down. But if you were to open your favorite book on operads and you see that, it's like a page of indices, don't be afraid, it's just this, it's not too bad. Um, okay, good, so examples, right? This is very abstract. Um, oh wait, sorry. Before examples, there's some housekeeping I should mention. Uh, some housekeeping, okay. Sometimes when you pick up that book on operads, um, you may see a little bit of a different definition. So sometimes folks like to define operads using what's called simultaneous composition. In other words, I have a pink tree, why not go ahead and you know simultaneously compose a bunch of other trees on top of it? Sure, that's fine. Or the definition I gave you on the couple of slides ago is what's sometimes called partial composition. So you can graph trees in one at a time or you can do them all simultaneously. It's not a big deal. Um, let's be flexible and use both. Another comment, I've defined operads to be a sequence of sets, but you are allowed to consider other objects besides sets. So for example, you may have a vector space worth of operations, or maybe your, your ON are really sets equipped with a topology. So you have topological spaces. In each of these cases, um, you would ask that the composition functions respect that structure. So if I have a sequence of vector spaces, I'd like my composition maps to be linear transformations. If I have a sequence of topological spaces, I'd like my composition maps to be continuous and so forth. So more generally, you can imagine if you like category theory and enrich an enrichment, this is kind of like getting to enrich category theory. So more generally, you can define an operad in any monoidal category, where the morphisms, the composition maps must be morphisms in that category. I have symmetric in parentheses because there's an additional, there's an additional thing you can do in operads, which is if I have a tree within leaves, you can imagine permuting the leaves, right? So you have a symmetric group action um, and you'd like to weave that into your axioms too. I'm leaving that out because we won't need that in this talk, but usually when people say operads, they actually, have in mind an action of the symmetric group. And so you can sort of make sense of this concept, not just in the category of sets, but in any symmetric monoidal category. So that's a little bit more general than we'll need for today. So that was the housekeeping. So now examples. I think you know where this is going. This is kind of the punchline because these pictures look familiar. Um, topological simplices form an operad. So, what are my sort of sets in my operad? Well, they're just the simplices themselves, but now we have sort of a shift in perspective. We're now going to think of a probability distribution on N elements as an abstract operation of arity N. We've already, we're kind of used to this already because we've been drawing distributions as trees with N leaves. So I'm just changing the name, but the concept is the same more or less. And what is composition? It's exactly that multiplication that we saw earlier when we flipped the coin and then thought about food. It's exactly that. I think this is interesting because that's a very elementary operation. I have two probability distributions and I can multiply them in a certain way. But if you were to look up, you know, in the index of your, you know, high school book on probability 101, I don't think you will find this is operad composition, and yet it's so elementary. But now we know where it lives in the land of math. It's operad composition. So I can take a distribution on n elements, a, a point in delta n, another distribution on m elements or a point in delta m, and I can get a new probability distribution, p circle i q. This is like that partial composition. And what is it? Well. It's like I stick the tree corresponding to Q on the ith leaf of P, which is labeled by the ith probability PI. And you can imagine, you know, sort of painting the leaves of Q with that PI. This, you have to just double check 
the claim is that that's a new probability distribution on n plus m minus one elements. And you can kind of see that here. Do all of these gray numbers add up to one? Yeah, just factor out pi from the purple tree. I'm left with the sum of the q's, that's one. Now I add up the pi's, that's one. So this indeed does give you a new probability distribution. So that's composition. And then operads come with identities too. That's just the you know, probability distribution on one element, which is the number one. Okay, so that's one example, the main example for the rest of the talk. But there's another one, and it's the motivating example we saw that introduces operads. Namely, if you have a set X, you can consider functions on products of that set back to itself. This is exactly the opening example that we saw. This has a name, this operad, famously, it's called the endomorphism operad associated to X. And composition, in this case, this sort of tree grafting, it's just the usual function composition that you learned in middle school or whenever we learned this. So if I have functions f and g, f is on, you know, it accepts n inputs from x, n elements from x, an n tuple. g accepts an m tuple. I can evaluate g on that m tuple. I get another element, and I can stick that element into any one of the in inputs of f, it's like multivariable function. I have lots of choices. So for each different choice, I have n of them. So I'll call them each different choice, f circle i g. And then you can just double check that the arity does indeed match. But that's just the opening example that we had. What's the identity for this operat? It's just the identity function from x to itself. You can check associativity and all that, but it turns out that it works. Now, here's the cool thing. Here's what I think is neat. Um, historically, operads came on the scene in the 60s, 70s, really in the realm of algebraic topology. So you can sort of think of operads. I mean, I've introduced them a la category theory, but you can kind of think of them as encoding algebraic structure. So um, if you have an associative algebra, turns out there's an operad for that. If you have a commutative algebra, there's an operad for that. If you have a Lie algebra, there's an operad for that. So it's kind of extracting the essential algebraic structure in your algebra um, and encoding it in this very abstract way. It's kind of like the skeleton that's underlying the algebra. Uh, but here we've seen now that probability distributions fit very nicely into this template that's been used in algebraic topology all of these years. And uh, I think Tom Linster was the first one to make this observation. In fact, he writes about this very op operad very nicely, again, in, in his new book that came out, Entropy and Diversity. Um, all right, now, um, before I move on, I, I want to stay on that topic for a while, but I do want to give you a remark, which I think will be helpful, especially when you come back on Friday. Operads will appear again on Friday, so I have to give you a little, a little disclaimer, okay? Here's an aside, parenthetical remark. Let's think back to this category theoretical example we had, a bunch of sets, functions on products of that set back to itself. Here's the thing, there's nothing really um, special about one object X. You can imagine taking the product of different objects, uh, sorry, different sets, call them X1, X2. I'm using different colors so you remember, they're different sets. And maybe I have a function on the product of these different sets and maybe it lands in a different set, call it Y. But if I have, you know, another function whose codomain is x1, this green thing, I can imagine plugging it in there. And similarly, so everything that we just said, you can imagine generalizing it to when there are multiple objects involved. This structure has a name. It's called a multi-category, or if you like, a colored operad because of the colors. So I just want to give you a heads up that when you walk into a talk and if someone says, I will tell you about operads, you have to say, wait, 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 what do you mean? Because sometimes when people say operad, they really mean 
a multi-category together with symmetric group action. That's not what I mean today though. I just mean the simple version, the one where you have one object and set with no symmetric group action. I think on Friday, you might hear about multi-categories. So just as a heads up, when you hear the word op -red, uh, you kind of, kind of have to ask folks, which, what do they mean? So that's the aside. Now, I wanna focus really only on topological simplices because I would like to get back to entropy now. How does all of this relate to entropy? What are we doing again? This up red business, it's so abstract. In fact, you may think, wait, 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 how is the probability distribution in operation? What are the inputs? You know, it, it, it's interesting because it's, it's more like the output is the input. <laughs> like you, 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 know, you start at the bottom, you go up and then you choose the hallway. So, yeah. You know, yeah, so the remark is it's almost reversed. It's like the you start at the bottom and then you choose one of these trees or hallways to walk down and then you get a number. Right, so what's this business about thinking about topological simplices as operas? It feels very abstract. How should we think intuitively of a distribution as an operad? How is it? Well, yes. There's a question in the chat. Question in the chat. Okay. Hi. Um, yeah, it's still about <clears throat> operads in general. Yeah. So what I'm a bit confused about is that it seems like um, all of them just have uh, objects labeled by the natural numbers, and you're allowed to glue any together. So I'm a bit confused how different operads are still different. It seems like they're all the same object in the end. Um how they're all the same object in the end. Ah, okay. So you can ask that your operads um, interact with each other in certain ways and satisfy certain equations. Okay, like I mentioned associativity. I mentioned commutativity. Those are equations that define an algebra. So you have operads, but you may want to impose additional equations on them among the abstract operations and those give you different flavors that's one way to get a different flavor yeah okay so uh, so in the same sense that like a category gets structure from rules on morphisms here you get the structure of the actual operand from the equivalence relations of the trees yeah. or something yeah essentially yeah yeah exactly so i've just Thanks. given you sort of here's what you start with and then you can go from there yeah great question thank you um Okay, so now I just want to address this question on the slide, though. How is a probability distribution operation? Well, the thing is, it's not. So don't think too hard on that because you won't get far. Um, but the point is that it's helpful then to actually think of abstract operations of arity in as concrete actual operations. In other words, we'd like to represent them. So what you'd like to do is to take each probability distribution, pick an object call it X, and assign to that distribution an actual anary operation on X. Now, anytime you have such an assignment, you have this operatic structure going on, so you'd like that assignment to be compatible with that structure. Um, let me give you an example. Pick the real line, and I'm going to use this notation end sub r of n suggestively. We saw the endomorphism operat earlier. I'm gonna let this denote the space of all continuous functions from r n to r. I mean, it's a set, but I really wanna work with topological spaces so that this assignment makes sense. I wanna work in the category of topological spaces. So let's just equip it with the product topology. Then what's a way to start with a probability distribution and get a continuous function from R into R? Well, a probability distribution is a list of numbers. Um, an element in Rn is a list of numbers or vectors. So I can just take the inner product of those two or the convex combinations. And then you can check, this is a continuous assignment and you can get out pencil and paper, and you can check that if I take two probability distributions, compose them, and then map them over, 
to functions. That's the same thing as first mapping my probability distributions individually over to functions and then composing them. So you can check that and you can also check that identity goes to identity. This is an example of a representation of the operad of topological simplices. The real line is a representation of this operad. More generally, this concept has a name. I called it a representation, but traditionally they're called algebras over operads. So, so here's the, the general definition. Given any operad of sets, say, this is what you'll usually find in a book, an O algebra, or I like to call it an O representation, is a set X together with a sequence of functions from the set of n area operations to this, you know, n area endomorphisms on X for all n. And you ask that that assignment be compatible with the operad structure in the way I just described. Now, if you kind of, um, you know, upgrade this to not just sets, but topological spaces, and you ask that this, this be continuous, um, we can, we can see in the example above that you can think of the real line as an algebra of delta. I'm, gonna, I'm using delta as the operad itself of topological simplices. Um, okay, so this is one way to think of the real line. Yeah, question? Um, so related to the previous slide as well, so I should therefore think of an example of such an algebra as like the expectation value function. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yes. Um, that's a nice way to think of it. Yeah. So on Zoom, you can think of this as like the expectation in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, more generally, the real line works, but any convex subset of Euclidean space can also be thought of as an algebra of this operand or a representation of it in sort of the similar way, taking convex combinations. Um, Okay, so this is like an introduction to operads, operads 101 and, and algebras over them or representations of them. Um, but now, finally, let's circle back to entropy. How, do, how does all of this come together? So I, I put here, maybe it's a little bit hard to read, but I'm just now you know, citing this question that Baez posed you know, many years ago in this blog post. He asked, how does the derivation way of thinking about the chain rule, remember, if we squint, it looks like a derivation or the product rule, how does it relate to operads? or some other characterization by Tom Linster using operads, which I didn't tell you about. But how does the chain rule and operads relate in terms of derivations? Okay, here's how, here's how I like to think of it. Let's work backwards. Because it turns out as soon as you make one definition, all of the pieces fall into place. It's almost just like an exercise after that point. Okay, so I just wanna help us get there and work backwards. What's a derivation really? Earlier I said, oh, it's like a function satisfying the product rule, but here's a definition. You'd find this in, you know, if you're familiar with algebra, a derivation of an algebra with values in a bimodule over that algebra is a linear map from the algebra to the bimodule satisfying the Leibniz rule. This is the actual definition. Given that, I wanna work backwards now. This is what I wanna see, but I need to make sense of all of these things here on the slide. So let me write down the desired equation. If a derivation is lurking behind the scenes of entropy, what do I wanna see? This is what I would like to see. I want some function on topological simplices, call it D, such that D of P times Q, quote unquote, is D of P times Q plus P times D of Q. I don't know yet what the codomain of D should be. I know that inputs are probabilities. I don't know what outputs are yet on this slide. One thing I do know is that P circle Q does not make sense. Yeah, Tom. Um, so we have time to discuss your definition of Yeah, yeah, I'm getting there. Okay. Yeah, because I haven't given it yet. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. I think we'll have time. Uh, not for operas, but for the, the one in terms of 
Yes, getting there, yes. Um, so this slide is not really helpful because P circle Q doesn't make sense, right? A P is like a tree with N leaves. So what does it mean to, to compose Q with it? I have to specify which leaf I mean. So, okay, I know that for each I, for each I going from one to N, if P is a probability distribution on N elements, my function D should satisfy this equation for each copy of I. And moreover, whatever D is valued in, whatever kind of thing D of P is, it's interacting with things of different types. I mean, Q is a probability distribution and D of P is who knows what. And same thing here, P is a probability distribution and D of Q is who knows what but I do know that there's a left and right action. So whatever this is, it must be a bimodule and potentially the left and right actions could be different. They could be the same. Um, but this is what I would like to see. If I'm gonna have a derivation valued on topological simplices, this is what I need. I also need not only a bimodule structure, I also need a notion of addition. <laughs> because they have to be able to add these things together, which really suggests I need some sort of abelian bimodule. So fine, then you just make that a definition. You declare this you know, to be the thing that you want. So our desired equations suggest the following definitions. Once we make these definitions, then I think it's pretty neat because all of the results just fall into place. So we'll say, Let's say that an abelian bimodule over our operat of simplices, like an operat, it's also a sequence of things. It's a sequence of topological spaces called an M1, N, M2, and so on. But I, I want a notion of adding things there. So we'll, let's say that each space should also have a notion of addition, an abelian monoid. Um, so left and right actions mean exactly what I saw in the previous slide. I can multiply an element in my module on the left by a probability distribution and get another element in the module. And the same thing for on the right. And, and moreover, you'd like these maps to be continuous if you're working in this category of topological spaces. Now, um, if you'd like, you can kind of make this definition general, you know, for any operat in any symmetric monoidal category, a, a billion bimodule is blah, blah, blah. And you can do that and that's fine. But let's just work on simplices. So this is a bimodule, which we need to make sense of the Leibniz rule. So finally, um, let me just say, yeah, by way of analogy, uh, it's kind of abstract. So here's, here's a really great example of a bimodule. So as every algebra is a bimodule over itself, so, there is a straightforward way to see that every algebra of the operat of simplices is a bimodule over itself in a straightforward way. Um, that's helpful only if you're familiar with algebra. If you're not, then don't worry about it. So I'm just gonna give you an example of what kind of thing D of P should be, right? Here's my desired equation. What is D of P? Here's the best example to think about. Think of functions on Rn valued in R. So we saw earlier that the real line is an example of a delta algebra. It's a representation of the operat of probabilities. And what I'm saying is that that's a good candidate to have a bimodule. In other words, for every probability distribution P on N elements, we can get another, we can get a function, which I will call DP on Rn. So, um, you know, if I have two functions on Rn, I can add them point-wise. That's great. So there's my abelianness. This is a space because I said put the product topology on it. So that works. And then what you can do is cleverly choose left and right actions. So you have to define what does it mean to take a probability distribution and multiply it by one of these functions dp. Now, I'm not going to give you an example of how to do it because it gets a little bit in the weeds, but there is a choice of left and right action that makes everything work out really nicely. And the thing is, is that if you were to put pencil to paper and try to work this out and see what would be a good example of a left and right action, 
there's basically one thing that can come well there's one thing that came to my mind and it was the kind of the obvious thing and that's the thing that works basically so the point is is it seems kind of messy right now but it turns out to be really straightforward so this is what we when we see the letters d of p now we should think of a function on rn whenever p is a probability distribution on n elements Uh, so, oh, um, so I was thinking much simpler than that. Um, I was just thinking that when I have an algebra and it's a bimodule over itself because I have an algebra element and I can multiply it on the left or right by another element in that algebra and then. Derivations on A as differential forms. Uh, that's, that's the, that's the, I'm trying to think of a heuristic to think of what, what this delta algebra over uh, delta actually is. It seems to me like a geometric way of some abstraction of cotangent bundle. Maybe. Yeah, um, I think that's a good question. I don't have a good heuristic for it. And maybe that's the one. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, it's a good question. Thank you. It's done by a chat. Yeah. But you know, if you have the algebra through function, derivation of the algebra through the function, and a manifold, you can take it as a vector form. Okay. Okay, so it's like a tangent function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, I wonder if my question. A little bit. When n equals two, what question I think is dp? Is that is it is it easier to understand what like, like as a function? Uh, when n equals two, dp is just the function from r cross r to r. Right. What is it for like d? What's happening with the? Oh 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 oh. Okay. So uh, right. Well, so we're kind of. I think we may be getting ahead of me a little bit. So right now, I just want to. I just want to say that an assignment of functions to probability distributions is an example of a bimodule. I'm not saying what it what DP is yet or what it what you should actually think of it as. It's just a function for now. Um, and I and I just want to use that to kind of make this definition. So um, we're going to say that a derivation of the operat of simplices. Given one of given an abelian bimodule M is a sequence of functions from delta N, the N minus one simplex, into one of the slices of this bimodule that satisfies that desired equ uh, equation a couple of slides ago, the Leibniz rule. This is a general definition. I can even say what a derivation is in an operat in any category, not just topological spaces and say something similar. Um, and I've just given you an example of a nice choice of bimodule. So I think it would be helpful to maybe summarize a before and after. So before you have entropy, which is a sequence of continuous functions on simplices valued in the reals that satisfies the chain rule. When you bring operads in the, to the picture, you're essentially upgrading that information. Now we have a derivation, which is a sequence of continuous functions also on topological simplices, but now we're thinking of the real line as one of these representations or algebras of it. And then there's questions of how do you think of that intuitively? Um, I think that's a good discussion maybe that we could have afterwards. I'd like to know. And instead of the chain rule now, we really have 
this Leibniz rule, which is this characteristic equation. Oh, that's not the phrase I want to use, but the you know equation that's of interest for right now. Um, now, I think the thing that's interesting is that once you make this definition, then then the results kind of just fall into place, almost like no work needs to be done. So here's a proposition. When you choose your bimodule to be the real line or this endomorphism of the real line and you equip a particular left and right action on it, kind of that simple one that I told you about, but it's not worth going into detail in the slides. Turns out that every derivation of this operad of simplices satisfies the chain rule. Okay, it satisfies its own version of the chain rule. Now in, on this slide, I've said basically, D of this composite distribution, P composed with Q1 up to Qn, where P is any distribution on N elements, basically it's like this chain rule. The reason I have said basically is because D of something is a function on Rn, but that value of n depends on you know the length of the distribution and i have different lengths on the left and right side but when you kind of um take care of all of that essentially this is what it's saying you sort of have to evaluate these functions on points and when you do that essentially it's just the chain rule and i really like to think about this in terms of pictures it's sort of saying d of this composite tree is d of the bottom leaf plus you know d applied to each of the top trees and these little circles here, I'm not gonna tell you what they are, but they have to do with this particular choice of left and right action. There's a question in the back. Yeah. But it doesn't in, in, in like algebra concepts, like that, you know, range that concept. You have like an algebra bimodule with algebra. But it, it seems like here, like you have a bimodule of the opera directly. Like it doesn't go like opera algebra bimodule. It just goes opera bimodule. Is that right? Um. That is correct. Okay. okay. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Another question? Uh, uh, no, but I just, I didn't know what you wanted to repeat that. Oh, yes. The question was, um, uh, there's this jump from operad straight to bimodule without needing to have this intermediary algebra over the operad and then have a statement about bimodules. Um, and is that what I meant to say? And the answer is yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in your picture, you don't show the weighting. Like that's right. Weighting yeah. The yeah, there's, yeah. Yeah. So the question was, yeah, where are the PIs here? They're not here. They should be there. Yeah. So it's not exactly the right picture. It would be better if I had PI, you know, P1, P2, P3. Yeah. I think you like yeah yeah there's a better way to draw this yeah um okay so that's a proposition when you have when you make this definition and you have derivations of the operative of simplices you see a version of the chain rule pop out um, but then finally, the climax is this correspondence I mentioned earlier. So this is kind of the main theorem, is that uh, Shannon entropy gives you one of these derivations. So Shannon entropy defines a derivation, and then going in the other direction, anytime you have a derivation of this operat, you can kind of get Shannon entropy out of it. So let me kind of say what I mean. Um, the first, the first part of this theorem before the comma, what do I mean? Shannon entropy defines a derivation. What I mean is, suppose I have a sequence of functions from delta n into functions from r into r. Now for each 
probability distribution, I have to give you a function, right, on Rn. So the question earlier was, oh, what is it? What is it? How should we think of it? So I'm going to tell you one. Fix a probability distribution P on n elements. What's a function from Rn to R? Well, just take the constant function at the entropy of P. So no matter what vector I have in Rn, my function on that vector is just the entropy of P, the entropy of P. It doesn't care what the input is. It's the entropy of P, constant at entropy of P. Then you can check if you make that assignment, that satisfies this abstract definition of a derivation of an op-rad. In other words, it will satisfy the Leibniz rule. And that turns out to be very easy to show. It just boils down to arithmetic, right? You don't even have to worry about this op-rad and stuff. It just boils down to checking something about actual H of P, entropy of P, and that is just arithmetic. It's like properties of law. So, so, so that it, direction is not very interesting. I think the other direction is much more interesting. And this is where um, Linster and Fadayev really did all of the hard work for this. So going in the other direction, every derivation, the, the theorem is, of this operad is a constant multiple of Shannon entropy when evaluated at the origin. What? OK, suppose we have a derivation. What is that? It's a sequence of continuous functions on simplices, right, valued in functions from R into R. So the point is, is that for each probability distribution P, you get a function on Rn. And the claim here is that if you evaluate that function at the origin, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, the output you can prove will actually be the entropy of the probability distribution you started with if you evaluate it at the origin. Why the origin? And what about all of the other points? OK, why the origin? Well, that's where Fadayev's theorem and Tom Leinster's version of it comes in. So you can look at the paper for the proof. It, it's also very straightforward. Again, they did the hard work. But what about the other points? What if I have a derivation and I evaluate it just a little bit away from the origin or far away from the origin? What do I get? I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question. I don't know the answer. So I would like uh, for someone else to work on that and maybe let me know. Oh, we have the answer. No, no, no. Oh. <laughs> because I may have misunderstood you. So um, you know, you pointed out that when you take the entropy, you're getting this constant value, uh, no matter what the case you say. And you're saying you recover entropy going the other way when you evaluate at zero, but you don't know what happens at other points? Or no matter which point you evaluate, you still get entropy. I just don't know what happens at the other points. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I can't. I can't conclude that you also get a constant multiple of Shannon entropy. It's not as straightforward then. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But that direction uses this nice theorem of Linster that I showed earlier. And I think what's really nice is that from all of this, the chain rule for entropy that we have seen both in this talk and the previous comes as a corollary. So it turns out that if you have one of these derivations, um, you can you know, use the previous proposition and this theorem to kind of uh, obtain the chain rule that, we, that we're familiar with as, as a result of that. So um, I have put here in quotation marks, the way I like to think of this is like, you know, the statement essentially in this correspondence is kind of like, you, know, you can think of entropy as like this constant multiple of this derivation if I move the C to the other side um, or you know, conversely. So, um, we started by asking, you know, entropy can be defined in terms of this very elementary derivation function, you know, A times log of A or negative A times log of A. Does that mean that entropy itself is like D of something? Um, well, maybe in some sense it is in this very abstract operatic kind of way. Um, I think that I will pause here for questions. I had, we have, you know, 15 minutes we could stop because that was a lot of information um, or depending on preference. Remember, I told you there are a few other really quick facets that I wanted to share because why should folks care about this? 
I think there are some other really interesting works that have related ideas, but you know, maybe by majority vote, we can not talk about them or if there are questions, we can take them. There's, there's one question from Simon. Okay, hi, Simon. Yeah, sure, we'll, we'll take Simon's question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, um, what's the name of the paper where we can find the nice, uh, the theorem that you just said? Oh, uh, thank you for asking. The, the title is called Entropy as a Topological Operad Derivation. Thank you. Thank you for asking, yeah. How the expectation value up like out to what yeah. that you mentioned earlier is not satisfied correct because it happens to equal zero at zero. Say wait the so the expectation value function that takes a probability and just says give me the expectation value of x in t mm -hmm. um, is such a function. But I, I, I guess I don't think it's satisfied. Oh, I thought, I thought it was. Ah, I confused. Okay, I confused the two. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. One more question? Yeah. Sure. Yes. 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 Um, oh, okay. Uh, no, 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 it's not. So fun so end from end of n, you know, n sub r of n, continuous function. So D, D of P is continuous. Yeah, not linear. Yeah. Yeah, no good question. Um, well, I saw in the chat that at least one person said more facets, please. Is that okay? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll keep this really, really fast. Um, this is the initiative for the theoretical sciences, which is very interdisciplinary. So, I, so I'd like to say a few other things about maybe related ideas that are a little bit tantalizing. And maybe there's connections and, or maybe there's not, I don't know. Uh, I think there are people probably in this audience that are much more of an expert than I am, but I did want to just say some things for the record that could be really interesting for, you know, further exploration. So one interesting body of work that you might be familiar with has a name called information cohomology. So forget everything now, okay? Uh, not too much, but just, I'm going to take our little gym and rotate a little bit more and look at another facet, okay? So forget about operad, blah, blah, blah. Here's something that may be familiar to you. Given discrete random variables X and Y, conditional entropy satisfies the following formula. I have joint random variables X and Y, the entropy of that has the same formula. Um, is the entropy of the first plus this conditional entropy, y given x. So like conditional entropy, oh, if I know how, if I know something about x, like how surprised am, am I to learn about things about y? Okay, if you were to look at an information theory book, you'd also see that this is called the chain rule. If you're wondering, it's basically the same as this operatic version. Okay, there's a way to see that there, it's basically saying the same thing. It's fun to work it out for yourself if you're, if you're curious. Um, now, let's do a little bit of massaging. Let's introduce new notation. If we let x times h of y denote this conditional entropy, h of x, y given x, then we can rewrite the chain rule so that it looks like this. H of X and Y is H of the first thing plus the first thing time eight times H of the second. Okay, this also looks familiar to, to us. This looks more like the chain rule that, that we've been talking about. 
but it also may feel a little bit more algebraic to you as well. So this is precisely the one co-cycle condition in group cohomology, if you're familiar with that. So in other words, given a group and a bimodule over that group, you can write down a certain co-chain complex with co-boundary operator D, I'm using curly D. And entropy is like a one co-chain in this, uh, a one, um, yeah, a one co-chain in this, in this co-chain complex. And if I apply the boundary operator and set that equal to zero, what you have on the left-hand side on the bottom is precisely that statement. And uh, maybe for the sake of time, I'll let you think about my claim that this is consistent with our theorem, that entropy is basically a derivation. I mean, a derivation is basically, you know, this one co-cycle condition where you have, you know, a trivial right action in group cohomology or trivial left action. So this is consistent. This is interesting. Um, and this analogy was teased out in full detail in 2015 in a paper by Pierre Badeau and Daniel Benequin, The Homological Nature of Entropy. Um, and on Friday, I think Tom Maniero will tell us a few more homological tools and how they also arise with in entropy in a very natural way. Um, that's one facet. I, I won't say more other than to just put that on your radar. Um, really quickly, I wanna tell you two things which I'm absolutely not an expert in, but I just think it's kind of fascinating how this also appears. So uh, on Friday, we'll also hear something about quantum physics and category theory and entropy and how those all mix together. So speaking of quantum physics and homological algebra or boundaries or co-boundaries, um, it turns out that Entropy and boundaries also appear in a really neat way in the world of quantum physics too. So I'll just keep this very briefly, but um, in physics, there's something known as an area law, which sort of says the following. If you have a whole bunch of particles, think of like a lattice like I have here, where at each intersection, there's like a little particle or a qubit. You can imagine, siphoning off a little region in this lattice. And you can ask, what is the entanglement entropy between that region and its complement? Entanglement entropy maybe sounds sophisticated, but it's just the Shannon entropy of the eigenvalues of a certain operator associated to that little region. Now, you may think, okay, all of these particles are contributing to the amount of information or correlation to the particles in its complement. So maybe you think, oh, if I increase this region, maybe it scales as like the volume of it. But it turns out um, commonly observed in certain quantum states, namely ground states of quantum many body systems, the entropy scales is just the boundary region or the sort of perimeter of this region. So the stuff on the inside doesn't really contribute much to this entanglement entropy, but it's these sort of particles on the perimeter that are doing the contribution. Um, I think that's inter interesting. You can actually work out a really simple toy example of this lattice. It turns out if you look at the number of cuts on the edge of this region and count them, the entanglement entropy in a, if you look at the correct quantum state on this, it's like the number of cuts times log of two. So like literally, as you just count what's on the boundary and entropy is proportional to that. In fact, you know what the constant is in this case is log of two in that case. So I just think that's interesting. I don't have anything more to say other than here's another statement about entropy and boundaries. Now, anytime you hear this, there's another similar result that's not far behind. Again, I'm not an expert, so I probably shouldn't even mention this, but I know there are physicists in the room, so I mention it for their benefit. Um, if you're familiar with black hole entropy, you have a black hole and you can look at the size of the event horizon or the surface area of the event horizon. And the entropy of that black hole is a constant time times that surface area. In fact, again, in this case, you know what the constant is. It's like, you know, one fourth times Boltzmann's constant times length, Planck's length squared. And if you know something about, you know, 
holography or ADS-CFT, then you know that there's similar discussions of entropy or information and an exchange between that and geometry or boundaries. So this kind of area law where entropy and D of something seems to kind of appear both in this, you know, nice world of physics, maybe also in homological algebra, and maybe also in this very abstract setting of derivations. And so maybe one question is, you know, are these things related? How are they related? What's really going on? There's lots, lots to, to learn about entropy and maybe, um, maybe there's more to discover. So um, other facets I mentioned, Tom will, will give a talk on some of his work involving uh, some of these ideas from homology um, and, and there are others, which I'll, I'll leave on this slide, but maybe not have time to say much more. Um, so I think that's it for now. Thank you.